I like to let them out Look, I see reality breaking down all my fantasies It would be nice if I at least had one fantasy That neutrality about to take a terabyte From the American apple pie better get a slice It's kinda scary the way that this life is moving on Marvin's doing backflips inside his grave, what's going on? We have head-on collisions, not seeing another's vision Maybe that's the reason why some colors fit the description A lot of relationships need life rafts, sinking ships I guess you just can't have only one like potato chips I would love for you to listen with an open heart But would you really even hear me if it's torn apart? I don't do the things that I used to I'll be fine even if I lose you Okay, okay, okay. okay. Peace and blessings family My name is Asar Motep And I am with the Martin Delaney Center for Egyptology As well as the popular YouTube channel Mbongi I am an Africologist and computer scientist out of Houston, Texas and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I have spent the last 20 years researching the connections between ancient Kemet, that is modern Egypt, and modern Bantu-speaking cultures of Central and Southern Africa. Throughout this 20-year journey, I've examined all the relevant literature in numerous languages, collected paleontological as well as archaeological data from across millennia. I have presented hypotheses and abandoned hypotheses, come to conclusions and abandoned conclusions, reviewed arguments for and against known hypotheses, and analyzed frameworks that sought to define and characterize the vast array of African experiences. After over 20 years of asking critical questions of history, of philosophy, religion, and culture, I have finally gotten to the point where I have complete and total faith in the results of our research. I say our research because I am one of among a number of scholars who have either laid the foundations in classical Africology or are continuing to expand and develop oh, yeah, all of us research on this connection between ancient Egyptian and Bantu civilizations. After spending so much time behind the computer and in the libraries and in the museums for over 20 years, I believe it is time to go out and to touch the living artifacts and engage with the people involved in the research whose stories we have been telling all this time, which brings us to why we are here today. Although I have written and will continue to write about the results of my research, my goal now is to summarize this data and present it in documentary film form. I have decided to put some of that computer science as well as new media experience together to creatively tell this important aspect of African history that many may not be aware of. The title of the film is China Intu, Ancient Kemet and the Intu Universe. And we are currently raising funds for the first phase of our journey. In February, 2022, I will be joining the crew of the award-winning documentary film, Hopi, The Role of Economics on the development of civilization for a very important returning to the source tour and conference in Egypt, which we know is in Northeast Africa. And while I am there, I will be shooting parts of our film, Chiena Into, and gathering footage for a proof of concept trailer, which will be used for greater fundraising efforts in the near future. And this is where you come in. I am currently trying to raise $5,000 to help with location expenses, equipment rentals, insurance, and the like, so that we can get some great shots for some primary as well as B-roll footage. When we return from Egypt, some of this footage will be combined with some preliminary interviews to compile a unique trailer to give the audience and potential investors a glimpse of the vision and potential of the film. Our ultimate goal is to travel to places like the Democratic Republic of Congo, Zimbabwe, Uganda, and South Africa for the first film. And did I forget to mention that we intend for this to be a series of documentary films. Therefore, subsequent films will require us to travel to places like Cameroon, Nigeria, Ghana, and Senegal, as well as Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia. We have big goals, and with your help, we can make this happen. And if you're interested in donating to this film project, please visit our website at www.chinaintofilm.com where you can leave a donation. 
There are other ways you can donate as well, which includes joining our Patreon page, uh, donating through Cash App, or donating live when we're doing the live show on YouTube. And the YouTube channel has over 6,000 subscribers, and Facebook has over 5,000 uh, subscribers as well. And with a minimum donation of like $5 each, we can uh, quickly reach our goal. You can spread the word of our efforts by sharing this video with friends and colleagues, as well as liking it. We appreciate your help and all donors will be given credit on the website, as well as at the end of the film during the credits. We thank you from the bottom of our heart to those who have given generously already and we look forward to bringing this important film to the public. Hotel. Yes, yes, yes. Today is Sunday, February the 13th, 2022, and I am your host, Asar Imhotep, and this is the Mbongi, and today's topic is titled, On Why DNA and DNA Studies Are Virtually Useless in ancient Egyptian studies. This is a continuation of our How to Critique the Critique series. And it is also Super Bowl Sunday. So I know many of y'all are going, are getting prepared uh, to watch the big game. I actually will be packing because uh, I'll be headed to Egypt in a few days. So uh, it's going to be a very good conversation, so you may want to grab some snacks, uh, get something to drink, make sure that you have a pen and pad, or if you, you know, in a digital age and you're using the um, uh, digital devices or whatnot, you know, to take your notes, I would encourage you to do so, because uh, we we are going to get it in today. And so, with that said, we welcome you to the Mbongi, and I'll be back in just a few. Peace and blessings again. Welcome to the Mbongi. And I guess I need to turn my camera on. That would uh, actually help the situation just a little bit. Uh, so, uh, again, this is the Mbongi. Today is Sunday, uh, February the 13th. And uh, tomorrow is Smalentine's Day uh, for all you lovers out there. And so, you know... Uh, I guess after the big game, you know, y'all can uh, have some uh, romantic plans if you're doing it a day early because uh, of work situations or whatnot. Uh, so peace to all the lovers out there. And speaking to all of the friends and lovers and the like of the channel, that is, want to give a shout out and, and love and blessings to everyone who has made themselves known in the chat. Uh, so peace and blessings to Adian Ferrer, if I'm saying that correctly. Thank you for joining. Uh, Edward 
Ngama 9 by 9 thank you for joining. Peace, Brother Emmanuel Adama. Always nice to have you. Dynamic is in the building. African World is in the building. Brother Sean Any Herrick Calfani is in the building. Brother Conan Lee, all the way uh, from London, is in the building. Donnie Williams is in the building. And peace and blessings to Brother Jaded, uh, excuse me, uh, Jaded Imak Hekara. Uh, always good to have you. Uh, Hatep to you. And Sylvia Stewart is in the building. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Safa says peace, and we say peace back to you. Brother Mathis is in the building, and Hotep to you. Uh, Medics82 is in the building, and thank you for joining us, as well as Sunjiata, Ada, Kakra, and Zombie. I think he changes the middle parts every single time he joins uh, the conversation. But uh, peace and blessings to you. Uh, Kali Hercules is in the building. Thank you for joining uh, from Facebook. Anointed Sadat Amin Ra is in the building. And I'm not even going to try to pronounce that because I know that's uh, one of them Khoisan uh, phonemes in the beginning. But like, who mean? Like, who mean? I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it though. I'm going to murder it if I'm going to try it. Uh, you know, it's like Skumin Niko Mesho, uh, Shinana. Uh, I'm gonna have to hear you say it, you know, because I'm, I'm just definitely uh murdering it. But uh, he's all the way from Namibia in the building. Thank you for joining. Uh, brother David Shaw is in the building, H Town in the building, and Done With It is in the buildings. And thank you, uh, for letting. Uh, excuse me, thank you all for joining uh, the conversation. And so, let me see. He says, Gumen, he says, Gumen Nikomesho. Well, Nikomesho, yeah, I'm gonna still have to hear you say it because uh, I, I don't, I don't want to disrespect it by mispronouncing it with my uh, southern United States country. Uh, accent or whatnot and so uh thank you all for joining and of course all of you who are joining live on twitter and as you know twitter is just getting into the fold of the live streaming um you know the if you make a comment there it doesn't necessarily post here so i can't see it uh so i would i would see it uh later on when i uh review the uh when I review the video on uh, on Twitter, and so, and peace and blessings to uh, Franklin Amarte. Uh, peace and blessings to you. Thanks again for joining. And so, yeah, you know, I don't want to waste too much time. I, I just want to get it in. And so, what's going to happen today? The conversation I anticipate to run over two hours, and so. You know, if it runs within two to three hours, I'm going to ultimately uh, chop up the video for an hour each and I'm going to re-upload. I'm going to still keep this one, this this long one. But for those who are catching the archives, they, you know, something more digestible. Um, but, I, you know, I didn't want to like break it up into two or three days. And so. Uh, so this is what we, you know, going to do. So we have a lot of information to go through and. Um, so that's why I'm saying make sure you have your snacks, make sure you have your 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 drinks, uh, your your attention. So today is a class. And so uh, just to reiterate today's topic, it is on why DNA studies are virtually useless in ancient Egyptian studies. And this actually is the result of several different issues that have e emerged recently in uh, the social media sphere and in the, uh, I guess, real life. So many of you already know that uh, I'll be going to Egypt in a few days and we were supposed to have a conference titled the One Africa Conference, Returning to the Source. And 
uh, which was supposed to be the last two days of the trip. Um, however, the 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 audacity of our presence and the subject of connecting ancient Egypt to all of Africa offended a lot of the Arabized Egyptians who uh, live there and are abroad. And so they made a big noise in uh, in Egypt and had the tourist people, uh, the people who are in charge of, you know, tourism and antiquity or whatnot, and the, the hotel where the event was being held, they uh, pressured them to cancel to cancel the event. So as of right now, the one Africa returning to the source conference has been canceled uh, in Egypt. That is, it, it has just been rescheduled um, for another date and time. Um, so it's still going to happen. However, in terms of the the Egypt, um, it being in Egypt, it has been uh, postponed. So those of you who have already purchased your tickets, uh, you should have gotten the correspondence by now on in terms of next steps. Uh, I don't have any updates in terms of where it's going to be and when um, in, in terms of at least solid information. So as soon as that is made known, I will make it known to each and every one of you. So. Uh, so with that being said, there is, you know, other conversations that has been happening just for a number of years in regards to this idea that you can use dna studies to determine population history of ancient egypt and and you know we've been battling this for a number of years but i've never really kind of formally addressed it in terms of a program so with with that in mind i am going to uh, address why that is fallacious uh in this day and age um in, in regards to the utilizing of uh dna studies to determine uh historical uh population density and and, and movement within ancient egypt uh, and and trying to link it to current populations and so um so that in in parts of that aspect of the discussion will will also trickle into some of the controversy uh, today in terms of the uh, current population. So, you know, for those who have been following, you know that there has been, um, you know, a lot of trolling, you know, these, you know, kind of Arab Russian bots, they, they create these fake uh, YouTube and uh, Facebook and Twitter accounts, and they just troll and spam, you know, post that is discussing ancient Egypt within its African context. And so, um, what you'll what you'll find in those comments is the racist rhetoric and the denial of the role of inner Africa in the development and the ongoing spirit of ancient Kemet. And so some of that will be addressed. Of course, we address that all the time. And uh, and of course, because they are trolls and they're, you know, Arabized Russian bots, they don't have uh, the the scholastic background to challenge the information. So all they do is resort to name calling and uh, and that's just basically it and just trolling. And so, you know, it's it's one thing when you have just a, an ignorant population, you know, creating fake accounts and uh, making comments. But it's another thing when you have uh, scholars on the other end uh, who are making an argument. And of course, those who are like bona fide and legit scholars, you know, they aren't as bold um, to to come out and make certain claims that some of these lay persons are, are doing because they understand that once they put a claim out there, they have to demonstrate this as a fact. And, you know, internet trolls don't, don't follow any kind of scholastic protocol. Uh, 
but scholars of course do which is why when you challenge any of them to a debate on the subject every one of them runs there's not one who will step up they're all fine excuses not to have the conversation because they're just trolls they're not scholars and so you know in order to dead this you know ultimately we're going to have to have the scholarly discussion with the scholars so that this information can be put out there and so what i'm going to do is uh share my screen so of course i have as always a powerpoint um and so hopefully this it is you know adequate enough um for the conversation and, and and you know even though this is you know kind of information packed it's still like just touching the surface of information that i have in regards to this conversation so again i'd like to thank each and every one of you for for joining the conversation and um oh before i start get started i just got one more announcement and it goes like That's right. This coming week also, there is a, another online conference. It's called West Africa and Beyond, Ancient Nubian and Egyptian Interconnections with the Niger Valley and the Atlantic World. And you can go to westafricabeyond.org to purchase your tickets. And it is going to be on Tuesday and Wednesday, February 15th and 16th, respectively. And you can visit the website and to see the uh the the times uh, the the times for your time zone of when the event is going to take place so and then you can just uh you know schedule yourself accordingly it's 35 dollars each day um i'm presenting on the second day which is going to be on the 16th and i'm on the i'm the first one on the first panel so, you know, check the times accordingly and, you know, get to see all the dynamic uh, researchers and, and speakers who are going to be part of this uh, dynamic conference. So no matter what you do, African scholars are always going to um, be there and, and present the information. So um, they, they, they really don't understand the, the beast they've woken up. But I'll, I'll digress on that point. So let's me share my screen. The Most High knew that I, not to give me a singing voice, because um, you know I would definitely not be doing scholarship. I would be in these streets if you know I could sing, and that is the truth. Uh, so let me just start this slideshow from the beginning and let me just make sure that on all the other devices that everything looks good. And thanks uh, to Sister Tamika, who's in the building and make sure that you like and the video and share with friends and colleagues. And if you are new to this channel please consider uh, subscribing. Help me to get over that 10,000 mark uh, so I can continue to bring hell to all those uh, anti-Africans in these internet streets. So uh, with that said, let me do this here. And so, okay. So on why DNA is virtually useless in ancient Egyptian studies. And so, I still got Philadelphia on there. Um, and so one of the things to, to really get into the meat of this conversation, 
would require several videos and especially since we're talking to a lay audience um the the details necessary to explain it is not impossible but we would have to slow certain things down and uh to do that video so i won't get too too in depth for the sake of the the greater uh objective of this particular discourse so you know one of the main issues of course is the that we're going to discuss is the fallacy of using genetics without a uh, historical context and so what i decided to do of course for all of my uh guests and and viewers uh so to help you kind of understand the the underlying depths of this conversation i i decided to share a number of articles from a special series uh within the journal of bioscience with each and every one of you so if you look in the description of this very video if you are watching on youtube and on facebook on the Asarm Hotep uh, Facebook page, uh, it won't show up on on Twitter. So if you if you want the document, you'll have to go uh, to either my AsarmHotep.com, excuse me, my Asarm Hotep YouTube, excuse me, uh, Facebook page or um, my YouTube page uh, here. And so in the description, you're going to find a link uh, to download from WeSendIt.com. And the link is only good for seven days. So, you know, if you are watching this later on, you're watching the archive and, you know, you're watching it within seven days from the 13th, because I just uploaded it today, you'll be able to download the link. Um, after that, you know, no love. You should have been subscribed to the channel and uh, you, you can download it. But, you know, if you're savvy, you'll notice that I put the names of the articles on the screen. So you can just look them up if if uh, you don't have uh, or if you come after the seven day time period to watch the video. So uh, I put it up there for those who, you know, uh, just to make it easier for them to get it. But for those who are not uh watching it within that seven day time period this video i mean within that seven day time period uh here are the the list of the articles uh for you to read so this is your homework assignment so this remember this is a class and y'all got homework so you know the uh the articles and genetic evidence and interpretation in history another one dna and cultures of remembrance anthropological genetics biohistories and biosocialities and then claude levi strauss on race history and genetics and then dna evidence in a question mark the impact of genetic research on historical debates and so these these are not like heavy genetic uh you know like numbers driven type uh articles so you a, a lay person should be able to follow along with each and every one of these these articles but the the point of the articles is to to demonstrate the issues involved when trying to use genetic studies to to talk about history and and so so that is there for you so you know so keep in after you've read this and and you come back to this video and reflecting on what has been said today you know um you'll you'll get to understand it a lot better so so uh, that is my gift to you all, and uh, thank you for joining. And so <laughs> another thing that you have to consider besides the historical context of, for example, just in general between history and genetics is that there's a lot of politics involved with genetic studies and, and historical genetic studies. And so um, uh, some years ago, I came across this article, which I have, you know, posted here. Uh, so, you know, you can write down the uh, title of it. 
and you you know you can find it and read it yourself it is titled egyptian museum test mummy's dna scholars try to identify remains of pharaoh thutmose the first uh, so this was uh, published online and on May 31st of 2008, right? So it uh, it starts off with scholars at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo are using state-of-the-art technology to determine if a mummy is that of Pharaoh Thutmose the third. I mean Thutmose the first. Zahi Awas, Egypt's Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities and chief archaeologist revealed to the Middle East News Agency on May 29, 2008, his plans for subjecting a 3,500-year-old mummy to DNA and other testing at Cairo's Egyptian Museum. And then it goes on and on and on. But I have here uh, bolded and underlined uh, a very important point here. So I'm just going to go to the next slide. Um, so that you know you are all able to to read it so in that underlying part of the of the article um the 2008 article it says egypt two years ago did dna test so that's from 2006 so egypt two years ago did dna tests on mummies and this is the result for reasons of national security DNA test results of Egyptian mummies are usually kept confidential. Some scholars conjecture that full disclosure of the research's uh, findings could lead to a major revision of the country's ancient dynastic history. And so you wonder how or why would you keep DNA tests of ancient mummies from 3,000 years ago confidential? Because more than likely they've tested a number of these mummies already and it doesn't fit their current narrative. And the reason why, like I have highlighted here, um, some scholars conjecture that the full disclosure of the researchers findings could lead to a major revision of the country's ancient dynastic history is because there is political fights on the ground in new uh between nubians and the egyptians uh excuse me nubians and the arab elite who who currently run you know egypt and you know when you're talking about land rights in indigenousness it's almost is 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 essentially the same as what's going on here in the United States when it comes to native americans and mexicans and stuff like this you have you know europeans who came and 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 conquered and went to war with these people and took over their land and 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 built a society on top of it of course with slave labor and but then have all these rules and things to try to push the Native Americans out and keep them from crossing more on their native land. And so there, there, there's been a lot of political issues, you know, regarding, you know, the, the treatment and the, in the presence of Native Americans here in the United States because of the colonial efforts. And it's the same thing going on in Egypt. And so what they like to push is this narrative that we've always been here. But if these DNA tests come back, you know, uh, proving otherwise, then we got to keep this stuff confidential because we don't want to to start any uh, uprisings or whatnot from these, quote unquote, they're labeling any black person a Nubian in in Egypt in, in terms of demanding their their rights and access to uh the land because they've always been there and so it would seem contradictory on their end because they're always uh arguing and fighting against israel talking about israel's occupation of palestine and claiming that the palestinians are the indigenous of this area yet they are doing the same thing when it comes to the uh uh the the indigenous 
you know, Egyptians and and other Africans of uh, of Sudan who have been living and migrating in, uh, in that space for thousands upon thousands of years. So when people try to use DNA studies to make arguments regarding ancient Kemet and Kemet being one of the original names of what is now called the Arab Republic of Egypt. So you always have to keep in mind the politicalness of the revelation of and the usage of uh, of DNA studies, and that they won't publish, you know, the 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 key haplogroups or the full genomes of of certain mummies. And so you always have to be you you always have to be skeptical about the the mummies that they do reveal, because they'll only reveal the ones that um uh, uh, appear to make connections with the middle east but the ones that are are shown to to be you know more closely related to to inner africans they keep that stuff confidential and have y'all sitting here arguing all on the net uh for no reason so this was back in 2008 that this article was published so you know uh as an example Many of you may be familiar with this this article uh, that was published in uh, 2017, uh, but titled "Ancient Egyptian Mummy Genome Suggests an Increase in Sub-Saharan African Ancestry in Post-Roman Periods." Right, and so this, you know, certain news outlets got a hold of this, and you know, uh, uh, many internet trolls have been trying to use this article and say that you know the the ancient egyptians are more close to people in the middle east and europe and that the ancient egyptians weren't black right so uh you know the abstract from that article reads as follows egypt located on the isthmus of africa is an ideal region to study historical population dynamics Due to its geographic location and documented interactions with ancient civilizations in Africa, Asia, and Europe, particularly in the first millennium BCE, Egypt endured foreign domination, leading to growing numbers of foreigners living within its uh, borders, possibly contributing genetically to the local population. So they, they admit on some level that there was an increase, at least in the New Kingdom, of foreigners, quote-unquote, uh, and that they possibly, in quotes, uh, may have contributed some, uh, some gene flow, you know, into the general population of ancient Egypt. We continue. Here we present 90 mitochondrial genomes as well as genome-wide data sets from three individuals obtained from Egyptian mummies. The samples, and, and I should stop there for a moment, they they found or they, they tested, I, I think, for 90 of them, um, you know, uh, mummies, um, but the the vast majority of them were not good enough to, to do the kind of study. Only three of them were. So we get the, the full complete set from three of the mummies, um, which they talk about here. And so while 90 were tested over time, only three of them was suitable enough to do the kind of tests that they were looking for. So we continue. The samples recovered from Middle Egypt span around 1300 years of ancient Egyptian history from the New Kingdom to the Roman period. Our analyses revealed that ancient Egyptians shared more ancestry with Near Easterners than present-day Egyptians, who received additional Sub-Saharan admixture in more recent times. This analysis establishes ancient Egyptian mummies as a genetic source to study ancient human history and offers the perspective of deciphering Egypt's past at a genome-wide level. I have the word e ancient Egyptians highlighted in red, Notice what we what they did here in the abstract. They say we only got three mummies. We have in terms of a genome-wide data set from three individuals obtained from Egyptian mummies, but then go on to say that 
uh, our analyses revealed that ancient Egyptians, ancient Egyptians shared more ancestry with Near Easterners than present day Egyptians. And they're arguing that the present day Egyptians, the reason why they have, uh, they're less related to the people in the Middle East is because of some sub-Saharan uh, gene flow, you know, in, in recent times. And of course, in the article, they, they, they uh, suggest that this is because of slavery. Anytime that there's a black presence anywhere in the Middle East and North Africa, they automatically assume slavery. Slavery is the, the number one reason why they're there. And so <laughs> for, for scholars of ancient Egypt, you know, they tore a, a hole in their behinds on this. Like, how are you going to make a genetic, excuse me, a, a population argument based upon three mummies from uh, such a late period? Like there was, it's in, in, um, in argumentation and logic, they committed what we call a transubstantive fallacy. And a transubstantive fallacy is when you take information for which you studied in one narrow uh, sense, in one narrow area, and then you try to apply it in other areas for which you have not studied. And then try to make generalizations based on that. And so this, what they did is they they did a transubstantive error, logical fallacy. And so I continue. And so, uh, in the article, and I'm quoting from the online version. They they have a PDF of it that you can uh, get as well. <clears throat> they they state by comparing ancient individuals from Abu Sir El Malik. With modern Egyptian reference populations, we found an influx of sub-Saharan African ancestry after the Roman period, which corroborates the findings of Hen and colleagues. Further investigation would be needed to link this influx to particular historical processes. So you 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 see what I uh, highlighted here in the red. So they're they're making historical judgments. But they're saying at the same time, further investigation would be needed to link this influx to particular historical processes, meaning they didn't do that work beforehand, which means they say that they should have just stuck to the genetic question and discussed it within the narrow confines of the locations in the time period um, as a local phenomenon um, for those genomes that were actually studied. But they they made the transubstantive error by trying to link it to all Egyptians in all periods over a three thousand almost four thousand year history, which is just ludicrous. And you wonder how some of this stuff gets passed through peer review. This is why when um, you know people out there touting peer review, peer review don't mean shit. Anything like a lot of stuff can get past peer review. And if you actually look at the peer review, they they addressed a lot of the issues that later scholars had also addressed as well. But it still passed anyway. So we continue. Possible causal factors include increased mobility down the Nile and increased long distance commerce between sub-Saharan Africa and Egypt. Trans-Saharan slave trade may have been particularly important as it moved between six and seven million sub-Saharan slaves to Northern Africa over a span of some 1,250 years, reaching its high point in the 19th century. However, <laughs> however, we note that our genetic data were obtained from a single site in Middle Egypt and may not be representative for all ancient Egypt. If that is the case, then why even in your abstract do you uh, try to uh, hint that it does? This is something that was pointed out by a number of scholars as well. 
it is possible that populations in the south of Egypt were more closely related to those of Nubia and had a higher sub-Saharan genetic component, which which is uh, stupid because the Sudan is considered North Africa. So why the heck do they keep referring to Sudan and the Sudanese and Nubia as sub-Saharan, but is 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 technically classified as North African? above the Sahara line. So you see the, the tomfoolery and trickery they try to do? And, and this is why they don't like African-centered scholars, because we, we can point out this stuff. And the inconsistency in the terminology and words and definitions that they use. Because Nubia is not in sub-Saharan Africa. It's in North Africa. And so... Uh, in which the argument for an influx of sub-Saharan ancestries after the Roman period might only be partially valid to and have to be nuanced. You think? Throughout the pharaonic, and the reason why they, they have to word it that way because there's the assumption that the ancient Egyptians were not black folks. And so any, they, they have cognitive dissonance. Any kind of presence of what they're labeling as black Africans, it has to be the result of slavery. That, you know, they're not intelligent, they're not mobile enough to be able to just walk down the street and, and live and dwell, and they're not even the original people from that area. So you can see how the biasness of the researchers permeates into the, the lack of of rigorous methodology when framing this particular genetic study. And so throughout the pharaonic history, there was an intense interaction between Egypt and Nubia, ranging from trade to conquest and colonialism. And there is compelling evidence for ethnic complexity within households uh, with Egyptian men marrying Nubian women and vice versa. Clearly, more genetic studies on ancient human remains from southern Egypt and Sudan are needed before apodictic statements can be made. Do you think? And that's part of the problem with the genetic studies, because all of the genetic studies, for the most part, are done on late kingdom to Roman and, and Greco-Roman period uh, mummies and remains. And so... They, you know, uh, they don't do them on older mummies and older findings. And then on top of that, you have to, in, you, you would have to have a large sample size of, of worthy uh, uh, specimens to be able to even remotely suggest population dynamics. And so the the they know what they're doing because they'll do anything. They think that you know African scholars are not savvy enough to catch this, and we don't have enough people uh, who are scientists who can point out these things. And so this is where the uh, this is the map of where, and I think I'm going to go full screen. So y'all can better see uh, the 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 content. So you know this is from the actual article itself, the map. And so there, the where you see the square is where the mummies were found. And notice that up here on the top, I don't know if you can see it. It's going to say El Fayum. And so we, you know the Fayum. This is going to be very important later. Right, but notice this is in uh, close to the delta, and of course to the Suez Canal and Sinai Peninsula, where all of these other immigrants and things, you know, were 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 coming in in large droves. So this is going to be very important for our discussion because you you have these individuals, you know, laypersons, enthusiasts, as well as some scholars who will try to make the argument that there is, quote unquote, no evidence of a large scale population replacement um, 
in regards to uh, ancient Egypt coming from some foreign place. And that's just not true. That's why you always have to situate the genetic studies within the historical context. Because the Egyptians are telling you that they had uh, uh, fluctuations of foreigners into their uh, society. In all periods of Egyptian history. And we're going to get into that. So, you know, um, a, a number of African scholars have responded to that one particular article. And I just want to, you know, kind of highlight one. And that is, is titled Ancient Egyptian Genomes from Northern Egypt, Further Discussion, uh, co-authored by Jean-Philippe Gordin, uh, who we've had on this program. Dr. Shramarka Keita, uh, all of these are, are doctors, by the way, um, Jean-Luc Gordin, and the late Dr. Alain Anselet, right? And so, you know, they they broke up the, the, uh, the response into uh, three major areas. And that is what, you know, in terms of the issues with the, the Abu Sir, uh, genome study and so one of the things that they highlight is the sampling and methodological strategy they say the samples can be questioned as to their representativeness of egypt in terms of size spatio-temporal and socio-cultural aspects like none of this stuff was considered in in the article like it was it was just premature um then you have historiography and misinterpretation and so remember that everything always has to be uh, situated within its proper historical context. And it says the authors do not consider explanations based on historical narrative, although they present historical information. And so like their findings of these three samples at this time in this area would not be surprising in terms of you know, finding some genomes that are, are similar to that which you find in the Middle East. Because over, you know, 3,000 years, Middle Easterners have been uh, flooding in to Egypt. So much so that in the second intermediate period, they had enough numbers to gain power and rule lower Egypt when um, there was political instability within the confederacy that we know as ancient Kemet. You know, if they, if they were just small numbers, they would not be able to just, uh, without uh, a major invasion, take over that territory. So, and lastly, he says, uh, they say on the definition of African, he says, uh, Schooneman et al., seem to implicitly suggest that only sub-Saharan African equals Africa and that there are no interconnections between the various regions of Africa not rooted in the slave trade, which is a common and a favorite trope. So like this, this paper was just all over the place. And this is why I stress to you every single week, methodology, understand and learn research methodology. Learn how to critique and learn how to critique the critiques. Because they, uh, and, and, and why linguistics and language is important. Because people try to give you the okie doke in certain language. Because again, in, in these researchers' minds, you know, you can only be African if you look like a Yoruba man. Like there's only one way to be African. And so they, they go out of their way to try to separate those of darker hue in various phenotypes um, from those of lighter hue of a foreign origin. And if there's any kind of quote unquote in between, they always try to explain it by admixture, quote unquote, air quotes for those you know, uh, who can't see me. 
And, and this is the kind of stuff that we deal with as scholars, you know, always trying to correct their, the, the slick, uh, uh, faulty ass, you know, uh, peer reviewed journal published articles. You know, and so it, yes, is a true Negro theory. And so I wanted to highlight some other considerations, you know, even within the, um, the context of the articles that I've suggested. And again, there is a number of articles that um, I have uh, provided for those of you who are listening. You know, there the, the link is in the description to where you can download it's a zip file and is is pdfs you know in relation to the the greater subject in which we're um engaged in today right so um so so other things to consider when we're we're having uh discussions about dna and and histiography and that is most historical frameworks used in genetic publications are outdated. So like just in that one from 2017, you know, they're still using stuff like sub-Saharan African and then referring to the, the, the people who are the, the dark African folks who are native to Egypt and the Sudan and, and whatnot as sub-Saharan African. When they don't, when they're not from Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, and 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 if it wasn't, uh, if it wasn't a a taboo in in scholarship today, they would be using the word Negro, because that's ultimately what they want to say. So next, we must always ask. What is the relation between biological and cultural history? Because when we're having this conversation about ancient Egypt, we don't study ancient Egypt. Ancient Egypt is not worthy of study because of any kind of bio any kind of biology that they have, any type of haplogroup or skin color or hair texture. That, that has no correlation with the culture of a people. And we'll get more into that, you know, a little later. But what you find in a lot of these studies and a lot of these discussions is that underlying the, uh, the conversation in the spirit of the discourse is that they, these people are linking biological morphologies, phenotypes, uh, genomes with intelligence, with uh, culture, and you can't do that because that is unscientific, it's pseudoscientific. But you, you have people who are claiming to represent science using pseudoscientific correlations that is not grounded in any kind of reality. So that's why you always, when you when you're you're viewing these studies, you always have to ask, what is the relation between biological and cultural history? Because they don't always correlate, if they correlate at all. And so, you know, one of the articles in which uh, we we highlighted here is from um, Levi Strauss, and so in in you know when you study his uh, analyses, you know, he's one that has embraced the view that culture produced racial and biological difference rather than the other way around. So the only reason why we are having this conversation is because of European people who created this concept of biological races and the assumption that these morphological and genealogical differences equated into differences in intelligence and uh, abilities and culture. And because of that history connected with slavery and the like, we are having this conversation now, which the ancients didn't have. 
you know, until you start dealing with like the the Jews and Hebrews and the Arabs later on, and then the cops later on, then Romans, you know, later on in that in that context, you you start to see these these correlations. And we'll get into uh, one example a little later. So, and lastly, also we must note that studies of genetic history appear nearly exclusively in scientific journals, not least because of the pressure to publish in respected journals. References to historical, linguistic, anthropological, or archaeological studies in these publications are scarce, and only very few list co-authors from these disciplines. So they, these studies don't be interdisciplinary. They, they only publish in biological uh, journals. And because of that, they don't get the, the, the critical feedback from those in the other disciplines. And they do this, and this, and, uh, is, this is discussed in one of the articles that I gave you, because you have those individuals in the sciences, uh, in the biological sciences, who look down on on other disciplines that don't have the alleged rigor of of the biological sciences and so they they try to avoid you know having to deal with that is they 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 utilize that information at the bare minimum uh to say that they did but then just try to you know try to make it as quote unquote uh biologically rigorous as possible and when they do that, they always catch the wrath of historians, and in this case, Egyptologists and the like, because they miss critical aspects of history, critical aspects of culture that would explain certain um, certain phenomena in the study. And so these are some things that you just have to uh, keep in mind. And so, you know, you, you when you know, you got to be weary of a lot of these uh, conversations online about like genetics and genetics says people just be throwing R1B, M88, V, this, this, and this in the conversation without any kind of context, without any real serious knowledge of the, the, the history, theories and frameworks of the, the field itself. And so be leading all kinds of people astray and they're thinking in their mind, they're being scientific in terms of their thinking. And the problem is that they won't even recognize that they're not being scientific because they don't do science. When you don't do science as a reality, you know, you, you can just hear stuff and, and regurgitate stuff and not, um, uh, and, and not, you know, have that critical eye to be able to to spot the errors or methodological flaws within a particular type of study. And this is what we're fighting against. This is why we preach each week methodology, methodology, methodology. Read books on research methodology for every single field that you are interested in. If you have a chance, do, you know, there's there's no reason that you as an adult should have stopped doing field trips and learning about different industries and the like. Get to know people in the fields, ask them critical questions of, of, of you know, what, what determines proper uh, methods and, you know, who are the leading scientists and what are the fundamental issues and, uh, you know, hopes and uh, you know, for the field and the like. So I'll continue. And because of a lot of this pseudoscience that is going on, you have these other racists, like the racist trolls who got the event shut down, who like to share these memes and think they're being intelligent. So, like if you see this meme, this was one of them that was shared on on one of the pages, uh you know when they when the Arabized uh, Russian bots were were you know trying to troll 
the the happy film and um in other pages people related to it so you can see on the left hand side that this you know uh caricature of a quote unquote stereotypical quote unquote negro is saying my ancestor to an ancient egyptian mummy but you notice that the ancient egyptian mummy is all gold and yellow they try to make it bright in all of this and so what they're trying to imply is that you know the the african over here is delusional for trying to relate himself to these folks over here and you can see within that second um uh meme over here on the right it, it i don't know if y'all can read it you know depending on what uh the size of your um the size of your uh screen but i'll just read it so you 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 see in the top box here there's a uh a finger of an uh of a quote unquote stereotypical black african person and it has two buttons that they're pressing so one says egyptians were black but then the underlying it says also that the Egyptians enslaved the Jews. And then we have on the right, whites invented slavery. But then they they have under their reparations. So uh, so what is supposed to be uh the implication is that, you know, for the quote unquote black pharaoh, you know, he's he's sweating trying to make a decision because if he pushes the button on the left that the Egyptians were black, then you know, that would also mean that they were responsible for enslaving the Jews, which we all know is a fallacy unto itself because the Jews weren't enslaved. And so that's just Jewish people lying on Africans. Uh, but, you know, that's another conversation for another day. Then we have on the right, if you press that button that the whites invented slavery, then, you know, uh, and you can get reparations, but, but it would be contradictory allegedly to, according to the mean, because the ancient Egyptians were black and enslaved the Jews. So we would we would be in contradistinction um, in, in regards to this and that. So, you know, you have these people sharing these memes. And and it's not only that, not it's not only shared by the pale skin, you know, uh Arabized Russian bots all on the net, but also the Negro peans who think that they're being intelligent by siding with those other ignorant mofos who have no basis in history, have no knowledge of history. And so these are the kinds of things that we're, we're fighting against even as we speak. So there's probably, I don't even know, I didn't even check the chat. It, you know, any uh, Arabized Russian bots, you know, um, trolling, you know, waiting for, you know, an opportunity to troll their, their rhetoric. And so, in these discussions, you will find that they keep every single time that they want to show ancient Egyptians on, you know, whether it's a National Geographic special or, you know, when they having these conversations online, they want to show these images here of allegedly light skinned, you know, straight nose more european and middle eastern type uh egyptians and these are supposed to be the representatives of the general population of ancient egyptians but which is interesting because they never can show a scene in any ancient relief where where there's a multitude of people where the multitude looks like anyone on this um, on this collage here, you know, and you know, and so we find this problematic, and so so they want to show these, and we're not saying that these are not ancient Egyptians. To be an ancient Egyptian just means you had to be a citizen of ancient Egypt, and so you know, I'm an American. But I would not mistake being an American for being, you know, of Italian descent. Although there are Italians who live here, and then you know, yeah, places like Little Italy. You know, I would not, I would not say that I am, 
a a a Mexican American, you know, or, or of Mayan uh, ancestry, even though they too are American citizens. You find the descendants of those as American citizens. There's a difference between being an American citizen versus being a you know a a a Cherokee or Inuit or a you know um that's 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 more narrow that has its own language customs and history and things of that nature and so the the colonial forces from great britain and you know in france and spain they they took over certain parts of you know this uh hemisphere and as, of course these northern united uh, which is now called the united states and you know louisiana had a big portion and there was mexico and then of course with the louisiana purchase and the loss there they took over that and expanded the the territory of the united states of america but you know there's history there's nuance there and so you know you couldn't talk about an american phenotype or whatnot because America is just simply the name of the state. This is so my nationality is American, but that is not, you know, American doesn't even have its own language. We speak English because that's the language from a place called England. Anglais in France, in Francais. Right? So we don't even have our own language here. It's just a dialect variant of the language that originated on the island of England. But that's neither here nor there. So remember that the essential argument is that uh, a number of uh, migrations happen, you know, coming from the, the Middle East into Egypt. And this is just a uh, an excerpt from the Wikipedia article titled Ancient Egyptian Race Controversy, which itself is all over the place. <laughs> but but notice what I read here. So, you know, Barbara Mertz writes in Red Land, Black Land, Daily Life in Ancient Egypt. Egyptian civilization was not Mediterranean or African, Semitic or Hermetic, black or white, but all of them. It was, in short, Egyptian. So they try to make it seem like Egyptian is is not, um, you know, singly any one of these things, but it's a composite in that it was unique unto itself, right? So then we have Catherine Barr, professor of archaeology and classical studies, wrote in Ancient Egyptians and the issue of race that Egyptians were the indigenous farmers of the lower now neither black nor white as races are conceived today do you see how slick she was with the wording here so um so black and white are only reference a quote-unquote extreme so when she says egyptians were the indigenous farmers of the lower now what does she mean by the lower now she mean in lower egypt in terms of the delta are those the real egyptians or she's saying the lower Nile in terms of, you know, what we call Upper Egypt on the borders of Sudan. She's not clear. She's using ambiguous language. Neither black or nor white as races are conceived today. Slick talk. Nikki Nelson wrote in Egyptomaniacs, how we became obsessed with ancient Egypt, that ancient Egypt was neither black nor white, and that the repeated attempt by advocates of either ideology to seize the ownership of ancient Egypt simply perpetuates an old tradition, one of removing agency and control of their heritage from the modern population living along the banks of the Nile. Now, keep in mind, I want y'all make sure y'all keeping these notes and y'all y'all jotting down keywords. They, in the modern era, they keep trying to these scholars keep trying to say that the Egyptians were neither black nor white. They were just this kind of ambiguous group in between 
and that they're they weren't African, even though it's in Africa. They weren't African. They, they, there's this mysterious Mediterranean. Mediterranean don't even mean anything. So they're trying to muddy the waters to make it seem like it's just everyone was just everywhere. We're just having fun. We came together as a big melting pot and they created this new race called the ancient Egyptians. So then we have, you know, uh, races like Zahi Hawass, and I'm going to have to uh, pause the the sharing of that for a second and let me make sure so i'm going to play uh an excerpt of a video so let's share my screen again i'm going to do the chrome tab and so we have this sister hopefully y'all can see you know uh this here and so this sister from arise news um is is asking the question are the ancient egyptians black and she's interviewing a number of folks and she in she interviews these i can't even call him a scholar i, I really don't know what to call him you know he's an opportunist and you know everyone has had issues with zahi hawass which is why he was forced from leading the um being the head of the antiquities because he was bullying and trying to refuse uh certain digs and all this and the, and the progress of egyptology was being stalled because of him um but sorry i gotta skip the ad so let me like that so hopefully y'all be able to hear let me make sure. So they're talking about Shek onto Diop and his arguments for a black African uh, Egypt, right? So hopefully y'all can hear the the video when I play it. So I'll make it a, as full screen as I can. So uh, here we go. By all experts on the matter. We spoke to Dr. Zahi Hawass, an award-winning, world-renowned archaeologist. His life's work has been dedicated to the discovery and research of ancient Egyptian antiquities. Not surprisingly, his office is full of books on the topic, some of which depict dark-skinned ancient Egyptians. But he says there's an explanation. No, they were dark skinned, but they were not black. But they are not negro. Because look at the 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 negroes like that and the rose like this. It's not the Egyptian. Only one of Hopefully, you heard that. Let me know if you said it got an echo. See, that's what I was afraid of. Um, and it's probably because my mic is in front of. Okay, I'm going to go back and, and play a little bit. And y'all in the chat, let me know if you can hear it. I'm going to mute my mic. And, uh, and when I mute my mic, y'all tell me if y'all can uh, hear the video. So I'm, I'm about to mute my mic and I'm going to play the video right now ancient Egyptians, but he says there's an explanation. No, they were dark skinned, but they were not black. But they are not Negro. Mm. Because look at the, the, the length of the, the Negroes like that and the nose like this. It's not really in the Egyptian uh, origin at all. It's mm. different, completely different. Mm. And this is why we have, you cannot connect the Egyptian civilization with the African at all. It's different. Uh, or from Celebrus time, Mesopotamia, mm -hmm. it's different, completely. Sheikh Handel Yub is from uh, Singal. And he announced that the origin of the Egyptian were Negro, mm -hmm. based on the statues of Ramses II 
and the statues of, uh, of Tutankhamun were, was black. And actually, UNESCO did make a conference to discuss that. And they said there is no evidence, we have to postpone this. Another group, Diop's research, claims to justify a black identity in ancient Egypt were the Kushites of Kush Kingdom. Originating in what is today Sudan, the kingdom began in 1070 BC and lasted some 1,400 years. It was after King Kushta invaded Egypt in the 8th century BC, Kushite kings ruled the 25th dynasty of Egypt as pharaohs for a century. But what race were the Egyptians the Kushites met when they got there? It's true that the black from Kush ruled Egypt in dynasty 25. Right. And this is what the black Americans are proud of. Yes. But they mix the 25th dynasty with the old kingdom and the new kingdom. They don't know the difference. Then they think that Egypt is a black civilization. It's not true. The black from Kush in the south ruled Egypt. It's a fact. Yes. But it's not the Egyptian civilization. It's not a Negro uh, civilization. Other theory that I believe in it, that the Egyptians were Egyptians. With arguments for and against ancient Egyptian blackness, we decided to take our own journey to the past. So hopefully y'all heard uh, what was said there. So if, you know, you understand uh, what we mean here. Uh, let me see. Um, hold on. I'm trying to share, reshare the screen. I'll just do that. Share. Okay. All right. So from current slide. All right. So getting back. So, you know, as stated, the you 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 heard him firsthand that the ancient Egyptians were not black, they were not Negro. So he so he's using uh, remember what I said in terms of uh, a lot of these scholars using outdated you know, tropes to, to frame the discussion. Then he made another stupid comment that the, the African Americans uh, don't know the difference between the 25th dynasty and all the other that we're getting and confused. Like no Negro, we, we understand very well. That's why we study and we read the text. We look at the primary source material. There's no confusion. The confusion is on their end. And, and so for him, Egyptian is its own race. And it, and, and it, it's just mind boggling. He says there's no connection to Africa whatsoever. So Egypt's not even in Africa for him. Y'all, y'all, y'all get what I'm saying? So y'all see what we're dealing with and all the, all the Arabized Russian trolls um, are utilizing this language. This, these are the arguments that they were making, right? That that Egypt is its own race. I can I can screenshot some of this stuff. That Egypt is its, the Egyptians were their own race. They they weren't black uh, folks. They weren't Negroes. It's not connected to Africa by any stretch of the imagination. These are these are the things that we deal with. So it is all the racist trolls like this pale researcher Zahi Hawass who tries to uh, make it seem that you know we're just out of our like we don't study this stuff. But it's interesting that he will never come to a conference and debate any African scholar when it comes to Egypt. He always runs. And, and, you know, and so he has a strong racist anti-African and a lot of them are just racist anti-Africans. That's those, those are all the trolls who are coming on the net thinking that we don't have scholarship to back up what we say. 
And because they don't have scholarship to back up what they say, they just try to use their political power to try to shut our voices when in Egypt. But none of them will ever face us, come face to face and, and have a discourse, a scholastic discourse on any of the points that we make. Not one of them. And, you know, that's why I have in my name, Asar, all the smoke, Imhotep. I want all the smoke from 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 the Russian bots to their to uh, the racist anti-Africans like Zahi Hawass to the Negro peons who think they intelligent making videos on YouTube. I want all the smoke. Bring me your best. So now, the next session is setting up the context <laughs> for, for the greater discussion. So remember that what uh, uh, one of the other major objectives that we're trying to have here is to show how the population of a place can gradually change over a 5,000 year period. Because people think that the, the face of the e uh, Egyptians today is representative of the face of the Egyptians during like the old and middle kingdom right and we're going to show that to be false and so what a lot of these uh arabized russian trolls don't understand is that we don't deny that y'all are descendants of ancient egyptians what we're saying is that you are highly admixed as a result of several different historical factors that are all documented. One, the, the gradual um, importation and settling of people from the Middle East from pre-dynastic times all the way to the present time. That on top of the invasions from the from the Syrians and the uh, Amorites and the um, the Greeks and the Libyans and the Persians and the Arabs, like over a five thousand year period. Remember that ancient Kemet itself lasted anywhere between thirty two hundred to thirty five hundred years going into the AD period, right? Then you got to add another 2,000 years on top of that to get to 2022. And so we're going to deal with that in this, in this discourse. So hopefully y'all can see the, the screen. I think y'all can see that well. So this is... Uh, an example of what why Afro Afrocentricity is is critical, and this isn't about Afrocentricity, but uh, underlying it has the same spirit of Afrocentricity, right? And so this is from a text uh, in inter interpretatio uh, Greca. Um, written in Italian and translated into English. Um, it says, uh, the Greek observer was not usually in a position to understand Egyptian religion from the inside. An initial obstacle was his ignorance of Egyptian. Sometimes an equation or an explanation was based on a misunderstanding of an Egyptian phenomena or a modification introduced on a Greek parallel. Each deviation, whether radical or slight, contributed to a remove from the true picture. And then um, the note here, 
is uh, it should be pointed out that Griffin's disapproves of discounting the Greek sources on Egyptian civilization as strongly as other scholars such as uh, Freudifon does. So what is what is he saying here? He's saying that there's that we can't heavily rely on Greek testimony uncritically about ancient Egypt when they're trying to explain certain phenomena or in trying to interpret like, you know, certain aspects of the culture of the ritual and things because they were so different. And what they're saying here is that, you know, there's, there's certain biases, certain frameworks that will uh, prevent you from seeing things from the perspective of the, the, the other in whom you're trying to report on. And that's essentially what Afrocentricity is about, is that there's a lot of Europeans and others trying to discuss African phenomena, but it's, it's not from the perspective of the insider. And so this goes back even to, to ancient times for the Greeks. And, and I, I put this note here, um, as the author, again, he's saying, I'm not discounting the Greeks in total because some people try to dismiss everything the Greeks say. And you can't do that. You just have to be critical and compare what they say to the actual written material of, of ancient Kemet. But the, the reason why ancient Kemet is why we have this approach is because the modern Egyptians regardless if they are biologically connected to the ancient Egyptians, they are culturally removed from them. That is not the same culture. Their culture is that of the Arabs. And because the Arabic and Semitic groups and the, the Europeans are so far removed from the dynamic in the culture of the ancient Egyptians, we have to go to the relatives of the Egyptians to see what the collective uh, framework based on their relationship in terms of language and culture and shared history may provide us in, in illuminating certain ancient Egyptian phenomena as supported by the primary text, right? So. This is why situating ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt in its proper African context is very important. And, and we'll see other scholars recognize this. But of course, the Arabized um, Russian bots are not going to understand this because they don't practice, they don't worship Ma'at, they don't worship Amun. And all of this, they, these are not deities. They have replaced, they have abandoned their culture to adopt Arab culture. This is why when you go there, these, these folks are removing um, hieroglyphics from the temples. This is stuff that I've seen myself when I was there last. They're defacing the... Uh, uh, the monuments and things. People for who this is their heritage don't do stuff like that. And this is this is you know what we have to keep in mind here. And so I just wanted to put this as a as an external because if of course if I cite any black African scholars who say this, then I'm being biased and it's blackology not understanding that this is proper research methodology. And because all of the Negro peons don't actually do any research, they don't know about this history and what Afrocentricity means. It just means you put Africans at the center of their own reality. You give them their agency when they're talking about phenomena that uh, relates to them. It's simple, that's just proper research methods. We just localize it when we're speaking about Africa. We call it Afrocentricity. 
So now <laughs> there's there's the text. Uh, Y'all seen me, you know, um, advertise this text many a times, but you know, this is a, a good text that I recommend. Uh, I still, I have certain issues with it, but I have certain issues with every book, but um, it's called Ethnic Identities, Ethnic Identity in the Land of the Pharaohs. And see, see, the Russian bots don't understand this history that we're about to say here, which is standard, which every Egyptologist knows. But the people on the ground, because they don't even study their own history, they're, they're lost in the sauce. And so let me just go to full screen. So make sure that y'all can um, can hear this. I mean, see this. Uh, there we go. All righty. So on page six, when talking about the makeup of the ancient Egyptians, he states this on Egyptian identity. The ancient Egyptian state which initially developed in the region of Nakata in Upper Egypt around 3200 BCE. It's going to be important. I should have highlighted that in red. Because, you know, um, it, it's understood that the, the flow of, of Egyptian language and culture came from the south, which is called Upper Egypt, right? Uh, first expanded its territory to include the rest of Upper Egypt and then Lower Egypt. In the course of its history, this state managed to establish and lose its control of different and own and neighboring regions such as Lower Nubia and Upper Nubia in the south and the Levant in the north. Right. Therefore, when talking about ancient Egypt and ancient Egyptians, we have to bear in mind that these terms do not refer to a static society resistant to demographic social and cultural change strictly speaking there is no such thing as ancient egypt and ancient egyptians the land we refer to as ancient egypt although having its core in the nile valley from the delta to the first cataract either expanded or lost parts of its territories only to regain control of them again this is an important point here because depending upon the 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 range of the territory that's what determined whether you're an egyptian or not so there was a time where the territory of egypt expanded all the way into the levant and this is supposed to be around the time that the alleged you know israelites left uh, uh egypt or were forced out of egypt and you know, uh, committed genocide in Canaan and took over Canaan according to the biblical story. But all of that was Egypt at the time. So they were Egyptians. So we continue on pages six and seven. The people we refer to as ancient Egyptians were men, women, and children of different class backgrounds living in different towns and regions of the land. Some of them had foreign origins. Others were married to foreigners. That means they were native, but they found a foreign wife or husband or to people of foreign origin. Some never left their villages, towns or regions. Others traveled far away and frequently, meaning it's dynamic. This, this happens in all territories around the world. This is standard human uh, living protocol. Some spoke only ancient Egyptian language. Others spoke other languages too. The diversity is important to stress from the very beginning, and it will be extensively discussed throughout uh, the element. And the element is just his word of saying the book, you know, uh, which or, um, you know, we're, we're citing here today. So he's acknowledging here that when you're talking about an ancient Egyptian, you could be talking about someone who's native, uh, then someone uh, or people who have migrated in and settled and become citizens, people who are uh, native and married foreigners or whatnot. And then, of course, in the next generations, if they have children in the territory and they live and adopt the culture and language, they are Egyptians. So you're going to have a variety depending upon 
um, the 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 phenotypes of the immigrants and the things. You're going to have a variety and range of 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 forms in terms of you know you know skull shapes, height, weight, you know dental morphologies, et cetera, et cetera. African scholars have always acknowledged this. That's 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 never been our trope. And so it's it's sad when these Arabized Russian bots come to try come to a scholastic conversation and don't know the basics of the basic history for the land in which they live, trying to argue with us, can't read the text, don't live the culture. And so we go on. And so we go to the classical model. So remember, like when you when you read um what's his name? Martin Bernal, you know, he talks about you know the 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 classic model and the Aryan model. And the these folks here who are trying to argue that the ancient Egyptians, like Zahi Hawass, are not black, you know, or white, or that they are white you know, or closer to white folks and people in the Middle East. These are all people who follow the Aryan model. But the classic model is based upon the testimony of everyone else who lived outside of Egypt who interacted with the Egyptians. They were so different in terms of their phenotypes that they it was important for them to jot it down. And although I'm not going to go through all of the records, I'm going to just give you a few and 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 uh, make note that there is no classical author who contradicts any other author when it comes to describing the ancient Egyptians. So remember the conversation that the the you know the modern scholars who are utilizing the Aryan model they're trying to say that the Egyptians weren't black, they weren't white. They, they weren't none of this. They were just kind of this ambiguous group. The, the classical authors don't use such language. They were straight up and saying that these folks were blacks. And we'll get into it. So <laughs> this text here is from C.B. Owen. The title of the article is Contributions to the Ethnology of Egypt. This was written in 1875 in the Journal of the Anthropological Institute of Great Britain and Ireland, volume four, pages 223 to 254, right? So there's there's the link, you know, if y'all want to write it down and get it down and um, download it and read it yourself. And I should tell you that, you know, this is still whatever, what I'm about to write, read now, is still a product of his time. And so he cannot escape his Eurocentric racist ways. Um, but, you know, a broken clock is is right twice a day. And this is what we mean by being able to read a text and, and think critically uh, of, of what it is stating. So what's important to note about this scholar is that, you know, he is one who has traveled to Egypt in the 1800s. So and in during the 1800s there they there was a certain type of um there there was a certain type of understanding on who the ancient Egyptians were. <laughs> so on page 223 he says, different opinions and beliefs have been mooted at different periods on these questions. From the time of the venerable Archdeacon Squire, who affirms that Egypt was colonized about 130 years after the flood by immigrant Asiatics, descendants of Ham or Ham, the son of Noah. So he's quoting someone here, if you can see the quotes. Uh, those are, aren't his words. So whoever he's quoting, um, Dr. or excuse me, Ar Archdeacon Squire, you know, he believes that the ancient Egyptians were, um, 
you know, after the flood that, you know, uh, Asiatic immigrants came uh, and, and made a big population uh, change after the flood. So we'll ignore that for now. Um, so the author continues to the issue of the volume for 1871 of the Journal of the Ethnological Society of London, in which a biologically eminent fellow member who has himself visited Egypt affirms the aborigines, meaning the, the, the indigenous of the ancient civilized people of the country to have been of the physical type or pattern of the natives of Australia. I'm going to read that again. The person who he's citing, who uh, is a member of this society, uh, informed you know, everyone that uh, he believes that the Egyptians, because he traveled to Egypt, um, that the, the original people have the physical type or pattern of the natives of Australia. For writes Professor Hughesley, although the Egyptian has been much modified by civilization and probably by admixture, he still retains the dark skin, the black silky wavy hair, the long skull, the fleshy lips, and broadish ally of the nose, which we know distinguished his remote ancestors and which caused both him and them to approach the Australian and the dash you more nearly than they do other uh, form of mankind. And so let's go back to Zahi Hawass. He's saying here that although the we see the admixture, you know, we, we know that they had a whole bunch of light-skinned uh, e Egyptians, a lot of them still carry certain of the traits of the, of the darker ancestors who had these quote-unquote stereotypical uh, phenotypes, and you can even see that with Zahi Was with his nose, uh, his ancestral Negro nose that he's saying ain't ain't connected to to ancient Egypt. So when when you start looking at those indigenous Aborigines of Australia, these are the phenotypes that you see that are native there, right? And this is important. And but, you know, again, when you actually read the article, when you download the article, just remember that, you know, he's still a product of his time. So he's still kind of racist. So he still tries to lighten up the the native Australians. Right. But we, we know who the native Australians are. And. Excuse me. Um, I'm just trying to make sure there's something. OK, there we go. So. So this is these are the phenotypes that you see. So they're they're looking at the kind of the uh, straighter curly hair texture, still dark skin. Like if these people were in the United States, they would be labeled as blacks, Negroes. They have differing shades of blackness, right? And so when you read the article by that uh, the author. He's he he kind of doubles back and tries to make it, it uh, seem as if Rahotep and Nefret are the true representat representatives of the type of the ancient Egyptians. And we know that this is problematic because we know that these are, are fakes that were created in the 19th century. First of all, you don't even see ancient Egyptians uh with mustaches like this this is a mustaches from from great britain you know and so but here's something else that i wanted to to share from the article that i thought was interesting even though it's 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 not directly uh related to the the statement that was just said previously but he he starts naming the he, he starts uh trying to describe the statue that we see here of uh, Rahotep and Nefret, right? And so when he when he's talking about the statue, he says, these statues are colored, that of the male with a reddish ochre of the tint, which indicates in all later representations the chocolate brown complexion of the Egyptian as contrasted with the yellow representing the lighter complexion of the serial armenian races. 
Assyrians, Philistine, or Palestine people, nomad Arabs, and still more contrasted with the black of the Berbers, Nubians, and Sudan Negroes. These strongly different groups of mankind being so represented together in ancient Egyptian frescoes of the time of Thutmose III, which may be seen in the British Museum. As early as the Sixth Dynasty, certain soldiers serving in the Egyptian army were designated by the term always applied to the Negro in contradistinction to that of their lighter complexion master. So remember, I talk about a lot of these studies. They're still using out of date tropes, unscientific tropes. And so this is one of them, Negro. That's why you can't take Zahir Was as a serious scholar because he's he's sitting up there trying to argue that the ancient Egyptians weren't Negroes. Like, what the heck is a Negro? You know, and so you see here that they're calling the Berbers blacks. Because when he went by the when he went and visited that area in the 1800s, the Berbers were still blacks. They were still representative and still in the same category as the new the quote unquote Nubians and the Sudan Negroes, whatever that means. So you see the you, you see the issues that we have here? I don't know what I said. I'm trying to. Uh, All righty. So now we're going to go to a famous text um, called The Ruin of Empires in Chapter 4 by Constantine Francois de. Chaussebou, Comte de Vonny, or some say Count of Vonny, right? Now, this is another European who traveled to Egypt in the 1700s, so the 18th century, right? So notice what he says about the Egyptians based upon him traveling to Egypt. He says, a people now forgotten, discovered while others were yet barbarians, the elements of the arts and the sciences, a race of men now rejected from society for, they, for their sable skin and frizzled hair. Founded on the study of the laws of nature, those civil and religious systems which still govern the universe. So that's still a little bit poetic, but he talks about the sable and frizzled hair, right? But it gets more specific in, in, in you know, the further we go into the text. And so he says it would be easy to multiply citations upon this subject in terms of the blackness of the Egyptians, from which all, from all which it follows that we have the strongest reasons to believe that the country neighboring to the tropic was the cradle of the sciences and, the cons and of consequence that the first learned nation was a nation of blacks. So he's talking about ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet, as being the origins of the arts and sciences. And that this, this nation was a nation of blacks for it is incontrovertible incontrovertible that by the term ethiopians the ancients meant to represent a people of black complexion thick lips and woolly hair i am therefore inclined to believe that the inhabitants of lower egypt were originally remember what lower egypt is this is around the delta area that the inhabitants of Lower Egypt were originally a foreign colony imported from Syria and Arabia, a medley of different tribes of savages, originally shepherds and fishermen who by degrees formed themselves into a nation and who by nature and descent were enemies of the Thebans, meaning the, the, the upper Egyptians, by whom they were no doubt despised and treated as barbarians. So even when you watch uh, or, or, or look at the Narmer palette, you can see Narmer defeating the, the Asiatics 
who have come into the Delta. And it was after that war that the uniting, where they regained the territory of what is, you know, a, a quote unquote upper and lower Egypt. And he continues, I have suggested the same ideas in my travels into Syria, founded upon the black complexion of the Sphinx. And so he keeps connecting in terms of ancient Egypt, the Ethiopians, and the, the Sphinx itself, all being black folks. And that's because he traveled and that's what he saw. So he was able to distinguish those who were the descendants of, of foreigners of like Syria and Arabia versus those who were native Egyptians. So um, we continue. All have a bloated, talking about the Egyptians. Uh, he, he's describing them now. All have a bloated face, puffed up eyes, flat nose, thick lips, in a word, the true face of the mulatto. I was tempted to attribute it to the climate, to the climate, but when I visited the Sphinx, its appearance gave me the key to the riddle. On seeing that head, typically Negro in all its features, I remembered the remarkable passage where Herodotus says, as for me, I judge the Colchians to be a colony of the Egyptians because like them, they are black with woolly hair. In other words, the ancient Egyptians were true Negroes of the same type as the native born Africans. That being so, we can see how their blood mixed for several centuries with that of the Romans and the Greeks must have lost the intensity of its original color while re retaining nonetheless the imprint of its original mold. We can even state as a general principle that the face is a kind of monument able in many cases to attest or shed light on historical evidence on the origins of the peoples. So he's, he's stating here what, what has been stated by all the other modern scientists um, and modern um, Egyptologists is that the people who were there now are heavily mixed and that the color of the Egyptians from when they first started out to where they are now are not the same. And any, and any of these Arabized Russian bots who think otherwise don't know about their history. So, <laughs> which is why, hold on, I'm getting something to drink. Something to drink. Anyway. So, anyone who doesn't understand this history is going to be lost. That's why we don't argue that the light-skinned folks who are in Egypt aren't descendants of ancient Egyptians. It's silly. That's not our argument. You are. But the but the context is more nuanced. And this is the nuance that they don't want to talk about, which is why they don't want us there having a conversation in Egypt about this. So <laughs> we continue. He says, but returning to Egypt, returning to the subject of Egypt. <laughs> uh, Minister Untouchable said, why black dudes always sing when they getting food or something to drink? Hey, that's what we do. That's just what we do. But um, here we go. But returning to Egypt, the lesson she teaches history contains many reflections for philosophy. What a subject of meditation to see present barbarism and ignorance of the cops. I'm going to repeat that. This is in the 1700s. Seeing to see the present barbarism and ignorance of the cops. Descendants of the alliance between the profound genius of the Egyptians and the brilliant mind of the Greeks. Because the cops are ignorant of their history. Sure, they speak the liturgical language. 
but only in association with Christianity and, and Gnostic Christianity, right? But when it comes to, you can't go into Egypt today and, and find folks that have just been practicing the, the, the whole of their culture and tradition to modern times. They're ignorant of the facts because they've, they've abandoned their culture for that of either the, the, the Christians via the Greeks in terms of the Copts or the, the Arabs when adopting Islam. So now we continue. Just think that this race of black men Today, our slave and the object of our scorn is the very race to which we owe our arts and sciences and even the use of speech. Exactly, because, you know, he's, he's speaking profoundly here, and I'm not sure if he really understood at the time in terms of the African origins of humanity. The ability to walk upright and speak was grounded in inner Africa. So he's not lying here. Just imagine finally that it is in the midst of the people who call themselves the greatest friends and humanity that one has approved the most barbarous slavery and question whether black men have the same kind of intelligence as whites. That's why these Arabized Russian bots are so racist. Because there has been this long history of Europeans trying to vilify African people and associate dark skin with un with with unintelligence, with the inability to to do arts and sciences. Then all they can do is sing and dance. And because they don't want to be associated with that, they adopt the racism, you know, of their Arabized leaders, and of of European invaders. But, you know, Count Voni was one of the real ones who, upon seeing for himself the people in Egypt and the monuments and things of itself, had to do a 180 on, on this notion that, you know, Black people were incapable of um, intelligent feats, you know, um, that they were trying to solely attribute to European people. This is why this text is very important. So we have another text coming from uh, an earlier text uh, coming from uh, Rome in the period of the Roman uh, kingdom. And so it is called uh, Penelis uh, Deus Platus. Um, and in the text, you know, um, in Platus Penelis, there's a soldier by the name of Athamanides or uh, Athamanides or Athamanides. I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, so please forgive me. Threatens to beat a Carthaginian, a North African Berber, nurse by the name of Antarastalis, after she rejected his advances until, and now we're having quotes here, she is covered in blackness, blacker than an Egyptian. I'm going to read this and I'm going to say this again. You have a Roman soldier who is trying to make sexual advances at a Carthaginian woman, a North African woman. She rejects his sexual advances and then he responds with, he's going to beat her and make her black or black or excuse me to, yeah, to uh, that she's going to be uh, covered in blackness. You know, so like the whelps and things. And she's going to be blacker than an Egyptian. So while this is, you know, a lot of ladies can relate to this because you still have dudes who don't know how to handle rejection and want to result to violence when, when a, a woman doesn't agree to their sexual advances. But besides that issue, you have this issue, you know, where where he's going to beat her so black that he's going she's going to be blacker than the egyptian which tells you that in in this roman period 
that the that they understood the Egyptians to be black, the Ramech. So then, of course, we got to go even older. So you notice I'm going back in time and getting all these all the people who witnessed the the ancient Egyptians for themselves, not these these new age Arabized Russian bots who don't know nothing about history. So, and uh, Herodotus, you know, who we know was an ancient Greek writer and geographer and historian. Uh, was born in the Greek city of uh, Halicarnassus, part of the Persian Empire. He is known for having written the histories, a detailed account of the Greco-Persian Wars. Herodotus was the first writer to do systematic investigation of historical events. And so in his histories, book two, he states that I expect that these women were called doves by the people of Dodona because they spoke a strange language and the people thought it like the cries of birds. Then the woman spoke what they could understand. And this is why they say the dove uttered human speech. As long as she spoke in a foreign tongue, they thought her voice was like a voice of a bird. For how could a dove utter the speech of men? The tale that the dove was black signifies that the woman was an Egyptian. I'll repeat that last line. The tale that the dove was black signifies that the woman was Egyptian. So now, we we talk about uh, another aspect of this and this this seems to cause a lot of confusion for a lot of people who claim to do scholarship they don't under, they don't understand nuance and so herodotus in book 2 chapter 2 um or book 2 chapter uh, 104 he says for it is plain to see that the colchins are egyptians and what i say i myself noted before I heard it from others. When it occurred to me, I inquired of both peoples and the Colchians remembered the Egyptians better than the Egyptians remembered the Colchians. The Egyptians said that they considered the Colchians part of Sesostris's army. I myself guessed it, partly because they are black skinned and woolly haired, though that indeed counts for nothing since other peoples are too. But my better proof was that the Colchians and Egyptians and the Ethiopians are the only nations that have from the first practice circumcision. And so you have this double uh, descriptive here. So not only are they black skin, but they have woolly hair. And so what people try to, when they're trying to argue against this testimony, and they're looking at modern culture folks who just look lily white like any other you know, European person. But what they're not understanding is that there was a pocket of Colchins who were clearly not of the surrounding people. Of course, over time, they either died off or were integrated and um, with the natives and now their phenotype has changed in, ter in, to in terms of those few uh, Egyptian soldiers who were stationed that far up. And we have evidence, all kinds of evidence of um, through through the model of Negro Egyptian or China into these Africans in, in these particular areas. But that's a discussion for a whole nother day that we don't have time for. So now, so we, we, we've seen here, there's a contrast between the, the modern scholars who use the Aryan model, who try to deny the blackness in terms of the phenotype uh, the skin color of the ancient Egyptians. And then you have the classic authors who were there, who when every single time that they described the Egyptians, described them as black. There's no contradiction. Right? So this is, this is what uh, we have to keep in mind here. You know, do we trust the Arabized Russian bots? Or do we trust the people who were actually there at the time who described them 
for which their descriptions actually match the 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 egyptian self portraits of themselves throughout egyptian history and and this is it's just a silly argument that you be having with these negro pens who who don't understand who don't read who just who just do internet searches looking for oppositional arguments but don't know how to critique the critique and so now we're going to deal with the the role of culture because as we stated the you know the the initial egyptians were were defined as you know people of black pigmentation in in its various different degrees right and then that you had you know immigration of of folks coming out of europe and coming out of the middle east uh some as invaders others just as immigrants and who have who have assimilated to egyptian culture and they have lived and produced children and had marriages and have been existing there for thousands of years so we, we got to keep in mind that this is over a five thousand year time span that we're talking here so when we have a situation like this for a country that is situated uh, as a, a centerpiece in the crossroads of two major continents and um, and then just a major center between many powers uh, stretching from, you know, Greece, Rome, you know, uh, uh, Assyria, you know, Persia, um, you know, the the Canaanite, as well as Indian, you know, Iranian, and of course the Arabic, like, you know, all of these, these histories and cultures outside of Africa. And then of course you got inside of Africa with Libya, Sudan, Chad, uh, Ethiopia, Somalia, that, that area because of, of punt and trade there. So you're going to have a multitude and a mixture there. So it, it becomes, so whether the ancient Egyptians were black or not at some point becomes an irrelevant conversation because now these people are grouping together and they are creating a society, you know, based on the natural tensions of groups trying to, to live in a particular space. But the question then becomes, from where does all of these these particular ideas come from that give ancient Egypt its 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 symmetry? So when we were talking about the 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 name of the deities, whether we're talking about Osiris, whether we're talking about Isis, whether we're talking about Amun, Atum, Ptah, whether we're talking about Sekhmet, whether we're talking about you know Sebek or you know, the when we talk about the concept of the nun or kepera, et cetera, et cetera. Are are there any parallels to these outside of the the country or the state of Egypt, or, or are those all indigenous and was created on the spot? What about the the concept of Ma'at in terms of the burials, the rituals? the underlying philosophy and logic, the numbering system, kinship roles. What about kingship, the, 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 the structure of rulership? What is, where does that paradigm originate? Are there parallels anywhere else or all that you know indigenous to that area and doesn't exist anywhere else? You know, this is and when we're talking about worldview. These are the things that we 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 love and appreciate about ancient Egypt, not whether they had thick lips or dark skin or light skin or curly hair or straight hair. All that is just irrelevant. What we care about is the culture, the mindset the the motifs the art and what they don't understand is that when the african scholars look at ancient egypt they see their own cultures in it 
And and as we have demonstrated countless times on this channel, and in text that was uh, that we've written, is that this is easily explained because those uh, Egyptians, those founding Egyptians, derive from, to use their language, Sub-Saharan Africa, and they brought with them the culture of the mother culture. And it found its unique expression there based upon the environment and the tools that were available to them there. And then it found its expression differently when, 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 when their brothers and sisters migrated further west into uh, Chad and into Nigeria and Ghana. And when the others moved down into the Congo and into South Africa, in those traditions, they are still living the, the culture that is, is fossilized in papyri and on temple walls. Unlike the people who are living there now, who have some remnants of, of some things, but they don't have the culture, they don't have the paradigm. They don't have the underlying philosophy that governs their, their being in society. They abandon all of that for Arab culture. And so this is why, for example, Sir E. Wallace Budge, he states that there is no doubt in talking about the Egyptian religions of Osiris and the Egyptian resurrection in 1911, that the beliefs examined herein are of the indigenous origin, Nilotic or Sudani in the broadest signification of the word. I have endeavored to explain those which cannot be elucidated in any other way by the evidence which is afforded by the religions of the modern peoples who live in the great rivers of East, West, and Central Africa. Now, if we examine the religions of modern African peoples, we find that the beliefs underlying them are almost identical with those ancient Egyptian ones described above, as they are not derived from the Egyptians. It follows that they are the natural product of the religious mind of the natives of certain parts of Africa, which is the same in all periods. See, this is why they don't want us there to have this discussion, because we have these citations. So Sir E. Wallace Budge was somebody who studied the ancient Egyptian texts extensively, wrote all kinds of dictionaries in, in uh, translated texts, also uh, uh, translated, you know, Babylonian texts and Assyrian texts. He was no dummy. And when he says, when I look at this, and he also studied the Nilotic peoples in Sudan, he's like, this is Sudan religion. This is, this is African religion. So when Zahi Hawa says there's no connection to, to, to Africa and Negroes, he doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. I don't know how he even got that position to be head over the antiquities. And he doesn't even know anything about African history and culture, not even of Egyptian culture. He can't know anything about Egyptian culture. He has to read about Egyptian culture in ancient texts because he doesn't live the culture. It's not a part of their everyday experience. So now we go to uh, the Egyptologist, the French Egyptologist, uh, Serge Sonaron, who in his text, The Priest of Ancient Egypt, states, but for Egypt, the sea marks the limit of a world, of an African world. Thus, the dreams of Ogotomeli, or the Bantu philosophy, carries precious elements which help us to understand better certain aspects of Egyptian religious thought but we must expect to find little of platonic thought in this world. Again, 
another European, because you gotta, you know, for the Negro pens, you you can only cite European scholars for them to even consider what you're saying. So when the European scholars are the ones who actually examine and read the text and produce this and have knowledge of African um, knowledge systems, cultures, when they say, you know, that what you find in ancient Egypt and what you find in these modern black African countries and, and things are the exact same, that we can explain certain Egyptian phenomena by of finding recourse in modern black African cultures and language in religion and philosophy. You don't call them black ologists. Are they biased too? Are they, are they just idiots? Are they just making up this stuff? You see how they, they want to play games when it, when it comes to this work? So we even continue, we go back to uh, Count Voni in, in chapter four of Ruin of Empires. He says, the Ethiopians, says Lucian, page 985, were the first who invented the science of the stars and gave names to the planets, not at random and without meaning, but descriptive of the qualities which they conceived them to possess. And it was from them that this art passed still in an imperfect state to the Egyptians. And we know this to be true because years later, we, we have the archaeology to back up what um, Count Voni was saying in the 1700s. And so we should all know about Napta Playa which is a stone circle, which marks the summer solstice, you know, a time which coincided with the arrival of the monsoon rains in the Sahara Desert thousands of years ago. So with all that talk about Sirius rising and all this, this is, in, this is before pre-dynastic times. And this is where Napta Playa is. You see this? So this is the modern border of Egypt. But look where Napta Playa is. It's in Taseti. It's in Nubia. All of this down here. When you know uh Aswan is a little bit up here. I don't know if you can see my my um uh, my mouse. And then anything over here, this is quote unquote Nubia. The quote unquote Ethiopians. And everybody knows about Napta Playa. In, in the stargazing, it's this stuff which arose and was uh, brought into Egypt. This is standard Egyptology. So where the hell is Zahi Hawass getting this? There's no connection. You just can't take someone like that seriously. And it's, it's a shame that we can't have discourse. We have Arabized Russian bots trying to quell conversation because they don't want to deal with this information. So we got to understand this within the greater scope. So this is the, you know, just one map of a, a large watershed that was in the Sahara and, and ancient rivers that have since dried up. And so when he was talking about the monsoon rains uh, here in terms of not the fire, this marked the summer solstice to let us know when the floods were coming. Well, it wasn't even about the floods then because they, they, they weren't reliant on the now to overflow its banks for them to farm because they were getting rain. That's why the Sahara, excuse me, the Sahara was green at this time. And so there's, for example, a text uh, called Climate Controlled Holocene Occupation in the Sahara, Motor of Africa's Evolution. So they're talking about the importance of the Sahara Desert and when it was green and in its following desiccation, that was one of the major catalysts 
for migrations in ancient times, right? Uh, including the the population of the populating of the the Nile Valley. So here is a, a, a series of maps, you know, based upon excavations in terms of where they map the density of, of population centers at different times in history. So we have before 8,500 BCE on the far left, that is A. We have B, which is between 8,500 to 7,000 BCE. And we have C, 7,000, between 7,000 and 5,300 BCE. And then on the right, between 5,300 BCE to 3,500 BCE. You know, this is around the pre-dynastic time. And so let's read what it says for each one of these. So keep in mind that each of these red dots on the map represent population centers in density based upon the, the excavation and the, and the layers of, you know, the, the settlements in which uh, they were doing the excavation. So this is uh, Egypt at these different times. So notice. It says climate controlled occupation in the Eastern Sahara during the main phases of the Holocene. Red dots indicate major occupation areas. White dots indicate isolated settlements and ecological refuges and episodic transhumanists or transhumans. Rainfall zones are delimited by best estimate iso heights on the basis of geological, archaeozoological, and archaeobotanical data. During the last glacial maximum and the terminal Pleistocene, that is between 20,000 to 8,500 BCE, the Sahara Desert was void of any settlement outside of the Nile Valley and extended about 400 kilometers further south than it does today. B, so, so let's, so they're describing A. So during this time of the Holocene, there's 20, uh, between 20,000 and 8,500 BCE. See where the, the major population centers are. Between modern Egypt and Sudan, which we would call Upper Egypt, or this is all Tasseti or Nubia. And you have still in Upper Egypt, these other four or five spots um, that you can see here, if you can see my mouse. So this is when the Sahara was dry. So notice there's no red dots over here in these areas. But then we go to B. With the abrupt arrival of monsoon rains at 8,500 BCE, the hyperarid desert was replaced by savanna-like environments and swiftly inhabited by prehistoric settlers. So now we have uh, evidence of... Uh, these African folks who are settled in these particular areas and aspects of Egypt in the northern part of Sudan. So you see in, in the A column that they were concentrated, they were clustered in, in Tasseti, right? And then as the rains came and the environment changed and the animals began to migrate in these areas, the the uh, black populations moved into these areas following it. And even though they're kind of only focused on, you know, the modern territory of Egypt, this happened throughout the Sahara, in central Sahara that we saw earlier and the like. So, so now we're going to go to C and D for the next slide. So, uh, so during, and this is still on B, during the early Holocene hominid optimum, the Southern Sahara and the Nile Valley apparently were too moist and hazardous for appreciable human occupation. So you see, you notice in A over here that the red dots are concentrated in the, the south of Egypt, but there's no occupation here. That's because it was too arid and it was, uh, or it was swamp land when, once the, uh, the monsoons came. 
So it was too moist and hazardous for appreciable human occupation. So even when they spread out, there was no, there was not large settlements in um, in Lower Egypt going towards the Delta because this was all swamp back in the day. It was uninhabitable. So where did they go? They went into this area, going into Libya and et cetera, et cetera. And so now we go to see after 7,000 BCE, human settlement became well-established all over the Eastern Sahara, fostering the development of cattle pastoralism. Now we go to D, retreating monsoon rains caused the onset of desiccation of or drying of the Egyptian Sahara at 5,300 BCE. Prehistoric populations were forced to the Nile Valley or ecological refugees, uh, refuges and forced to exodus into the Sudanese Sahara where rainfall and surface water were still sufficient. The return of the full desert conditions all over Egypt at about 3500 BCE coincided with the initial stages of pharaonic civilization in the Nile Valley. This is very important to note. So now as a result of the desertification of the desert, now you have these, these oases, these, these last centers of, or sparsely populated in the Western desert. But now you are starting to see because now it's drying in the in the Delta area, uh, people moving and and settling in the Delta. But everybody, where's the largest concentration? All in the middle in in um, the southern part of Egypt, which is called you know Upper uh, Egypt and Tasseti. Right. So most of them went back. I don't know if they had ancestral memory or not, but for the most part, they went back to the main areas in which they originated thousands of years earlier. So if we go back over here on A, we see the concentration of the folks, and we, we assume, of course, that there wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't totally abandoned, but you can see in B and C that, you know, there was no privileged place to just be chilling on the waters over here because we got plenty of water. We got plenty of game over here in these other areas uh, closer to... Um, the western part of of you know the modern territory of Egypt, Libya, you know uh, Chad and Sudan. But once the desert started expanding, now it's forcing them to go and scatter every place. So you have some people who were in the Sahara who ended up in North Africa as those black Berbers that were witnessed by the by the observer that we uh, cited earlier. And some of them uh, went into Palestine and the like. And, you know, and, you know, we, we, we have a different conversation about the origins of, you know, proto-Semitic. And then, of course, we have the, the Egyptian population, those native dark Africans who left their mark in the Sahara. And so, like, you you see, for example, I don't know if y'all seen the the uh, documentary called "The Mystery of the Black Mummy," and it is located in uh, Tashwinat, um, and at this wadi of Muhajiag on this the far left part of Libya, right over Niger. Right, where you see this red dot, I mean, this red um, kind of location marker, uh, map location marker. And so this is the the site, it is a cave of the earliest mummy. And the there's aspects of it that we know for a fact became part of the ancient Egyptian culture. And, and it's titled The Black Mummy because the child was a quote-unquote stereotypical black Negro. And so the whole, the whole culture of mummification comes from these, uh, this cattle group that, that would uh, periodically you know, exist and live in these caves. 
And so when the desert began to uh, expand and the rain stopped coming and people, you know, who survived the droughts, who migrated, they brought that tradition with them over here in Egypt. And it became the whole, it became what Egyptians are known for. But these, these traditions exist elsewhere, especially in the Congo. And they're using the same words for a mummy that you find in ancient Egypt. If you have Aluja volume two, uh, I discussed this in the introduction. All right. So, so that's something to consider you know, when we're talking about the expansion. So, when you know, when people talk about Libyans, they always have these pale-skinned people in mind when they're talking about Libya, but they don't understand that that was the home of Black African people. And these are some of the people that still live in um, the territory of Libya, who that child was more than likely you know, uh, one of the the uh, the predecessors of you know uh, someone in these one of these three groups. So you know, you have the 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 Tebu, um, and I forgot who this lady is. Uh, no, she's part of the Tebu group, and there's a, a Teda Dona group. So this is from 1914. This photo on the far left. This is from 1922. On the right hand side, and I don't know what year this is. I'm pretty sure it's whenever it's probably small. Um, of this sister from Libya. So they don't talk about these folks when you when you're talking about so these are the original inhabitants of Libya and Libyans, the 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 Rebu or whatnot. And and you know, the original folks of the the mummified cultures and things. That that still live and and migrated, move in and out of of Libya and Chad and all of that in in Sudan. So when people talk about the Nubians, you know that's a that's a blanket term that don't mean anything. You know you got to be able to name folks. And so these are the these are the conversations that they don't want to have, which is why they can only troll online but can't have a conversation because now they got to contend with this stuff, stuff that they ain't never studied a, a day in their life. And so you can see, you know, them in the artwork, you know, and this early Saharan rock art with, with certain, certain things that you'll find later on in ancient Egypt. And we're going to have to have a conversation, you know, just on that, like these, these inner African uh, concepts, uh, or these Saharan concepts, I should say, that that become a tradition in ancient Kemet, you know, coming from the south, because these folks, they concentrated when they started migrating back, they migrated in, in large droves in the south. And so that's why it's important when, for example, when the even the biblical writers understood who the Egyptians were and where they are from. And so, you know, uh, I, I said this in one of the previous conversations, and I'm, you know, going to bring this up again. And, you know, the in the Bible, you will find this location called Pathros. And, you know, in Greek, Pathores, right? And it refers to Upper Egypt. And this is just from um, uh, Wiki here. And so it's primarily the Thebaid. It is mentioned in the Hebrew Bible in Jeremiah 44 and 1 and 15, Isaiah 11 and 11, and Ezekiel 29, 14, 30 and 14. It is the homeland of the path of Pathrusism or Pathrusim, Siam, I guess. Um, so the, the name Pathros comes from, it's a loan word from the Egyptian Pataresi, the southern land. And it really means this land uh, south of the head, the beginning, the origin. And so as in the Hebrew uh, and Greek, the term was used in Akkadian by the Assyrians as Paturisi, for example, in the annals of Asahardan. Uh, that's just extra information. 
but it refers to the southern part, that area which had that high concentration. And so when you read Ezekiel 29 and 14, 30 and 14, um, we're going to read 29 and 14. The uh, and I and I've gave different variations for those of you who you know been been following the conversation or the I don't even call it a debate, but the discourse between Zion Lex and myself. So you if you could watch that video on how to critique the critique, uh, you know, dealing with Yahweh and how Yahweh, I argue, comes out of ancient Egypt as one of the titles of Seth, you know, and it was adopted by the Kenites who were nomadic, you know, Arabs um, who was in and out of the Sinai and the, the, the mines there and were metallurgists. But that's another conversation for another time. But here, you know, it states here in Ezekiel 29 and 14, and this is Yahweh speaking, he says, I will bring back the captives of Mitzrayim, meaning Egypt, and will cause them to return into Eretz Patros. Eretz is the Hebrew word for, for land. So the land of Patros into the land of their ancestry, and they shall be there a lowly mamlechach, right? And kingdom. We should we should say here. So um so they're saying that this is the land of their ancestors. So even the Egyptian, excuse me, even the Hebrews, the Israelites, the writers of the Bible knew who the ancient Egyptians were and where they were from. So that's why it's very important when we first read that um that that genetic study when they're talking about if you know, the, the dynamics of the study would change if we move further south into Upper Egypt. We would expect to see more of the quote-unquote stereotypical Black African ancestry come up in the results. Those are the Egyptians. Those are the Ramech. And so, you know, so, you know, we have to reinforce, I'm, uh, state this again. But returning to Egypt, the lesson she teaches history contains many reflections for philosophy. What a subject of meditation to see the present barbarism and ignorance of the cops. Descendants of the alliance between the profound genius of the Egyptians and the brilliant mind of the Greeks. Just think that this race of black men today, our slave and the object of our scorn, is the very race to which we owe our arts, sciences, and even the use of our speech. Yada, yada, yada. And so remember that this is for those of you who are familiar with the, you know, the, the artifacts and the arguments that the, the kingship and the culture and everything comes from the South. This is, you know, from a group Nubia, right? And the first signs of Egyptian kingship in the artwork. And this is the Kistal incense burner, right? And so the A group refers to a culture found in northern Nubia between Aswan and the Second Cataract in far southern Egypt to the modern border of Sudan. An incense burner from Kustal has the image of a falcon and a man wearing the white crown of Upper Egypt. It shows that kingship, civilization, and history were simultaneous in Nubia and Kemet. In this early period, Nubia was referred to as Taseti. They were buried in simple oval or round pits called tumuli with shells, stone jewelry pots, and stone pallets for grinding cosmetics. And, and so we see here that we, we have the archaeological evidence of the southern origins of the culture and the people who, who founded pharaonic civilization. And we have testimony, not only by modern scholars, but even the Hebrews themselves. They knew who the Egyptians were. The same thing with the Greeks. That's why when, you know, when confronted in, in being in the Delta, when they saw all those light-skinned and mixed folks, they didn't consider them the, the Egyptians. When they saw the Egyptians, they understood them to be Black African people. And that's exactly what they said, except the word African, because it didn't, it didn't exist at that time. But they, they described them as Blacks in every single example of the uh, ancient model. 
So this is why they don't want to have the conversation. So, you know, so the what this underlying, the underlying thing here is, is that you can have, you know, uh, populations slowly trickling in and adding up over time. And uh, you can also have invasions, but also within that history, you can also have the original people being pushed out or migrating out voluntarily. Excuse me, I had to take another drink. So, for example, the early Semites, this is this is an interview that was done by Christopher Eric way back in 2012. And he says the early Semites were just a few Africans arriving in the Levant to find a lot of other people already in the area. There were already people, you know, from the first. Uh, migrations out of Africa, uh, as well as some back migrations out of India, which you can, you know, I discuss in the last chapter of Illusia Volume Two, that that plays a major role in this, in this larger discourse as well. Um, and so we got to understand that what we argue in in modern times is that Semitic does not really originate in Africa proper but in the Levant. And it's because of some African speakers related to the Egyptians would, um, who have been interacting with these some native groups that were already there. Over time, there the languages begin to converge and then we get proto-Semitic. And that's why you can find some affinities between ancient Egypt and Semitic, even though they're not closely related languages, right? And so this is all in pre-dynastic time during the fourth millennium BCE. And so when we have, you know, scholars, for example, like Catherine A. Bard, who's a Egyptologist, but more so an archaeologist, who has written several books, and we we cited her, you know, earlier. She's one of those people who try to make ancient Egyptians ambiguous, but show nothing but black Egyptians on the cover of her book. Um but in one of her articles, in an essay titled The Emergence of the Egyptian State, she says, between Kantar and Rafia, about 250 earlier settlements have been located by the North Sinai expedition of Ben Gurion University, with 80% of the ceramics of Egyptian wares dating to Nakata II and III in Dynasty Zero. Israeli archaeologists suggest that this evidence represents a commercial network established and controlled by the Egyptians as early as early Bronze Age 1A, and that this network was a major factor in the rise of urban settlements found later in Palestine in early Bronze Age 2. Naomi Parat's technological study of ceramics from EBA sites in southern Palestine clearly demonstrates that EBA or Early Bronze Age 1B strata, many of the pottery vessels used for food preparation were probably manufactured by Egyptian potters using Egyptian technology, but local Palestinian clays. In EB1B strata, there were also many storage jars made from Nile silt and marl wares, which must have been imported from Egypt. Not only did the Egyptians establish camps and way stations in the southern Sinai, but the ceramic evidence also suggests that they established a highly organized network of settlements in southern Palestine where an Egyptian population was resident. So not only did you have people from Palestine later coming into the Delta and settling because of this trade network, you had Egyptians in, this is an early Bronze Age, settling and creating colonies in Palestine. This is important for this conversation. And so, uh, and I don't know how to really pronounce this lady's name, uh, Dr. Agneski, Agneskia uh, Mazitniska, I'm totally murdering her name. Hopefully I can get her on a program and we can discuss her text, but she's written a text called Lower Egyptian Communities and their interactions with Southern Levant in the fourth millennium BC. That's the 35, the, the, the 3000s, 
you know, in, in, in older, for those who don't know what the fourth millennium BC is. So in her text, um, pages 42 and 43, she says, thus far it has been generally accepted that in the Chalcolithic period and in the beginning of the early Bronze one, the Sinai Peninsula remained under Southern Levantine influences. However, and remember at this time, there is there is not really much settlement in Egypt because it's all swamp. So they're not in Egypt at, at the Chalcolithic period. And I'm going to show you uh, a little later, you know, that that time period. So and in the beginning of the early Bronx one, the Sinai Peninsula remained under Southern Levantine influences. However, the research by an expedition from Ben Gurion University, which was mentioned earlier in the other text, in Northern Sinai shows that depending on the period, the status of Sinai vis-a-vis -vis different neighboring territories varied considerably, as suggested by numerous new sites found pastoral campsites dating from the Chalcolithic to the early Bronx age. Uh, early Bronx Fourth Age. Both on the Chalcolithic and Early Bronx sites, Canaanite pottery was accompanied by pre-dynastic Egyptian pottery, just like we just stated before. While on Chalcolithic sites, the amount of Egyptian pottery was insignificant. On EB1 sites, it sometimes represented as much as 80% of the entire material recovered. In Early Bronx One, the character of settlements in the north of Sinai changed as a result of intensified contacts between Egypt and southern Levant. In that period, the economy of the local population largely depended on the activity of the trade route connecting both regions. Egyptian Canaanite trade exchange constituted the, the reason for being of the early Bronx communities in Sinai. With Agriculture being an occupation of secondary importance. What is saying here is that, again, there's trade going on and it reinforces the other citation, which talks about the Egyptians having settlements in the Levant. And so this adds to why you find certain um, Egyptian concepts and things in, in Canaan, because they had the, uh, the, the power and prestige was on the side of the Egyptians. And this is before there was an Egyptian pharaonic history, right? So originally they cultivated their own separate identity and traditions. But over time, as the layer one, uh, you know, early bronze uh, age B material uh, shows, the strangers talking about the people coming from the Levant into Egypt assimilated with the locals and adopted lower Egyptian cultural traditions. The assimilation process was so powerful that materials dated to phase two show no traces indicating the presence of foreign settlers in Buto, which is in the Delta. So what they're saying here is that you, you have these waves of, of people coming into the Levant and at first, you can in the material it shows that they remain, they they had their separate identity and culture and things, but over time they all assimilated. This is before Pharaonic Egypt. And so when we talk about the Chalcolithic period, that's 7,000 to 5,000 BCE. This is during that time um when the the, the Sahara Desert was still. Uh, uh, green, right? And then from 5,000 around this time going up to 3,500 is when it started to, to desiccate and push everybody out. So when it comes time to that early Bronze Age um, period, then you're starting to see, you know, the increase in trade and things during this proto-dynastic period. So all this stuff you know, uh, is is related. And we got to keep these things in mind. And so, um, so to show even during pharaonic times that there were still Asiatics trickling in. Remember the what the point I'm trying to make here is that there are folks trying to argue that there is no evidence whatsoever of you know large scale population replacements or migrations coming out of the Levant. These are folks who have not examined the archaeological record 
and the historical record in terms of what the ancient Egyptians were saying for, for anything, because that is the exact opposite of what is said. So um, in this text, this text is called uh, titled Asiatics in Middle Kingdom Egypt, Perceptions and Reality, right? So it says the probable Theban province of the Brooklyn Papyrus may be evidence that the Asiatics who were generally settled in the north particularly in the area of the Delta, had become assimilated enough into Egyptian populace to be working in the South. So again, there's another text talking about the assimilation of these foreigners into Egyptian language and culture, so much so that they were comfortable going further South to be workers. So now, have become assimilated enough to be in, uh, enough into the Egyptian populace to be working in the South. The presence of two female Asiatic weavers is also attested at Cahun. So Middle Egypt is represented in this group as well. Barber in her study of textiles notes that in early societies, the making of textiles was predominantly a female occupation since it is, the, uh, since it is an occupation which can be carried out currently with childcare. She also points out, and I have this highlighted, that in Egypt, the labor force for textile manufacturer is almost exclusively female until the 18th dynasty. Thus, it is not surprising that Asiatic female servants would be placed in an occupation typical of women's work. But perhaps there was another reason. It is feasible that the Asiatic weavers were brought to Egypt for this purpose, since so many of the Asiatic women were utilized as weavers. Perhaps they were considered to be cheap labor, that their weaving was of a special nature. It is possible that the Western Asiatic immigrants now in Egypt were employed in tasks requiring special skills, perhaps various skills reflecting professions in which they were engaged in in their Mesopotamian or Canaanite homelands, in this case as weavers. And it goes on and on there. So the point I'm making here is that we we have evidence, according to the records and other archaeological um, material, that a, a, a number, a large number of women were imported out of uh, the Levant and other parts of Mesopotamia because of their specialization in weaving. And this is very important because in the that Abu Sir study, when it, when they're looking at the the DNA of the people and saying that they are closer to the Near Easterners, these they were closer to some of these old weaver towns for which a lot of these women were brought in. And so you got to remember, like unless there was just like this strict, we can only date each other. You know, people are having sex and having families. They're intermingling. There's this genetic exchange all over the place, right? So you know, this is this is throughout Egyptian history. So we continue. So here's some uh, painting of weavers from the tomb of Kanum Hotep II at Beni Hassan. So we see the complexion that they are depicted as, I don't know how many rows this sister got on her belly uh, here, but you know, so this is, this is what you see, right? And so they imported these weavers. And so uh, we have this one example. This is a, a text uh, titled Egyptian Textiles by Rosalind Hall. And she says, she states, that the annals of Thutmosis III report that Syrian captives were cloth makers on the estate of Amun at Karnak. So you know that Karnak is further down, kind of in the middle of Egypt, possibly instructing the Egyptians in the Asiatic art of tapestry weaving. The same pharaoh presented 150 Asiatic weavers to one official. So you know how they have all that, uh, uh, the, you know, they present people and they make offerings to kings and stuff. So this one, this one relief here uh, shows that they they offered at least one hundred and fifty fifty Asiatic weavers to a particular office. 
and they're all from Syria. And 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 Syria is going to become very important in in a little bit. So we go back to the Asiatics and Middle Kingdom, and I won't read all of this, but it's just talking about uh, weaving in Sumer and Lagash and how some of the people came from Sumer. Some of the women came from uh, Sumer um, because they were experts at weaving there and they were imported into Egypt. And so this is where Lagash is, if you can see this on the map in ancient Sumer. And, you know, ancient Akkad is up there, Tigris, you know, Uruk, Ur, allegedly where Abraham is from, Ur of Chaldees. So now, so what happens to a population when you have, as the description has already said, they shown that the, the Egyptians uh, are, are black African folks. And then you have a lot of these light-skinned folks coming in from Syria, Arabia, Mesopotamia, and Palestine, right? How does that change the dynamics of, of the offspring of their intimate interactions? And not to and 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 that's not discounting like any just just readily migrations, just voluntary migrations out of a spot, and then them coming and occupying a once abandoned place. Like that's a possibility that we always have to keep in mind and entertain and, and look for evidence for or against that hypothesis. But what I, I'm showing this slide here, this is me at a 2012 Shekanta Diop conference in Philadelphia. And these three ladies are Afro-Canadians, right? If, if I wouldn't have said Afro-Canadians, for the most part, you probably wouldn't think that these are Black folks, right? Now, they exist in a place in Canada where the 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 enslaved african descendant population is very narrow and there has been a lot of intermixing throughout the years so you know the the two ladies on, on the bigger picture almost kind of look mexican in a way or they look like they could be from the middle east the sister on the left still look like she could be a sister uh just a light-skinned sister but they're all sisters but th that's the point i'm trying to make but you can see just within this short time period how the, the genes change in terms of the phenotype. And so, but their ancestors were, were, were these folks. You know, these are actual photos from slave ships, right? And Conan Lee says they look black to me. I mean, because we accept a a a wide range of 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 black. So black is not just simply an exact measurable tone in terms of skin color. There's other features that we consider um, um, black, and and just the culture and the attitudes and the like. But the point is, if if they continue to to mate with other people that look like them and or lighter people throughout the generations those those that tint and color is going to fade certain features are going to fade certain things still may remain but you you'll find yourself in a situation like you do in present day Egypt is exactly the point that we're making here. And so this is what happened in Egypt. They these people are still descendants of Africans who were enslaved. But they also have other ancestries in their bloodline. And so they are rightful heirs of that inheritance as well. And it's the same thing with modern Egyptians. And so so this is how you know, we we get, and this is during the Fayum. So remember I said at the beginning of the conversation to, to pay attention to the Fayum. These are the Fayum mummy coverings. 
in in Roman times, and that and the Fium is over there near the Delta. So so they still have some tint of color to an extent, but look at look at them um, in in these pictures. So when 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 the Arabized Russian trolls want to argue on the internet and the Negro peons, their 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 intellectual slave servants want to uh argue that the ancient egyptians are not black quote unquote they always throw pictures like this in the mix without historical context right and you know you can see that their skin color is closer now to the folks who uh, uh live and originate in uh, what we just call Asia proper in Palestine, Syria, Arabia, etc. So, like, this is a relief uh, depicting the Battle of Amenhotep II during the 18th Dynasty in Thebes, right? So, you know, the the Egyptians were were very observant of their surroundings and of the people that they interacted with. So, notice how they, for some reason, the Egyptians have the the paint. To, to accurately depict the, the general range of color, of skin color, for everybody in that area. But the people want to argue that this is the natural skin color of the ancient Egyptians, but for some reason, they, they couldn't get it right. So let's, let's go back. So this is another depiction of an Asiatic in this particular relief. I just have it, you know, side by side of a modern you know, Asiatic uh, brother out of, you know, that that region. A little darker in terms of, but still kind of pink within that range, right? And, you know, his color matches more so the, even though this is kind of an extreme yellow on the right-hand side, his color more so matches the color that we see here for these uh, Syrian Amorite women uh, who were, were immigrants you know, during the 12th dynasty, right? Right after the, right after the, uh, the, the first intermediate period. So, uh, Negus says the video is choppy. Uh, I'm not sure, um, how I can actually fix that. So it just may be, you know, cause everybody's trying to get on the net and watch the Super Bowl in a few hours. So, you know, uh, which I guess kick, I mean, the the commentary starts in another hour and a half. So we'll be done way before then. And, but let me see. Uh, let me see. So, but you notice that uh, the, when they, when they're just uh, showing uh, other folks, you know, they have the right pigmentation as well. So you can see this is an Afar, this is a young Afar uh, brother, you know, who, you know, moves and operates in modern times in the Sudan and in the eastern desert uh, of, of Egypt. And you see that even to this date, they still have that stereotypical, you know, white. They have these oils and fats in their hair that turns it white. And you see this depicted in the the ancient Egyptian reliefs. So these these folks, these black folks, were the, in you know part of that original culture that created pharaonic Egyptian. And you see their representation even in the the artwork uh, here. And so how do you go from this, you know, to this? And so this is this a, a stark contrast. This is a, uh, also the Dynasty 12 Beni Hassan uh, Kanum Hotep tomb. And so you can see the Asiatic, you know, in his skin tone, more so of, you know, this deer uh, over here. And, and so, but then you contrast that with, you know, these ancient Egyptian women. And you notice, and, and be weary of those scholars who try to argue that, you know the the brown and the reddish uh, and and black skin color is symbolic, and the reason why we know this because the males are depicted 
in the the reddish brown color and the women are depicted yellow and those are only in special types of scenes which they don't give you context and nuance but when the egyptians are showing themselves and regularly in the groups they always depict themselves like this in this color and so you notice that the women these ancient egyptian women are not depicted yellow they're picked at the same color as their men. And it would be just stupid to think that the, the Egyptians would, would, would uh, or that there was, it was biologically possible for the women to be light skinned and the men to all be dark. And then they get together and have children. And then there is some genetic predisposition for, to have males as dark brown and red and and then the women as some kind of yellowish color just silliness they when the egyptians depict themselves this is the color that they depict themselves as not this this is later this is roman times after thousands of years of admixture but when the egyptians um again uh portrayed themselves they portrayed themselves with consciously and on purpose as a dark uh, reddish brown. From dark reddish brown to to stereotypical black. And you and this is something that you always have to fight against as well and, and give them pushback. So with 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 the Negro peans and the the Arabized Russian bots will try to argue is that for example this is wood and the wood was darkened over time and that's why this is the way that it is but they don't understand that this wood is painted the real color of the wood is this color over here that you see the second from the right individual if you can see my mouse going up and down so all the paint has faded from this individual See, they, are, they were consciously painted their skin this way. So this is all paint. But when the paint is removed, you see the true color of the wood. And the wood never darkens to a brownish, reddish color. That's not the color of, of the inside of wood. That's why you always got to uh, show the 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 actual artifacts and you don't deal with people and their conjectures this is how the egyptians described the uh, depicted themselves with these with these afros these aren't wigs and helmets and other silliness you know how hot you can tell these folks ain't never been to egypt it's hot as hell in egypt ain't nobody walking around with no goddamn afro wig just silliness so how do we go from that to this? It's admixture over time. And this is during the Roman period. They're even lighter now. So again, when they describe, when they, when they do the artwork of themselves, it is always a black African people in their varying phenotypes and hair textures. Always, they never show these. When they want to show ancient Egyptians, they want to say that these are the representation, but they never want to show you this artwork. They never want to go back and show you this artwork. They never want to go back and show you this artwork. When all of those Greeks and, and Romans and the, the later you know uh, English people were coming into Egypt and they were seeing the Egyptians, this is who they were seeing. That's why they described them as black and, and grouped them with the Ethiopians. And so you can do this. The, it doesn't take any large scale invasion from a, uh, from a foreign land. So as an example, let's look at the population of African-Americans. 
So during that 200 or so year of importation uh, of Africans into the United States, you know, uh, via slave ships, you know, the United States actually had the lowest number of imports of Africans out of all the, the, the colonial spaces in terms of in comparison to Europe and in comparison to uh, like Mexico and South America, et cetera, et cetera right in the caribbean islands and we're not even going to in, include you know uh arabia and certain parts of north africa right so the total number on record and we know there's probably a lot more than this but but the roundabout figure is that it was of a 305,326 people so that's like the total amount of imported africans that were that were enslaved in the in the United States during that time period. So of course, you know, a lot of us were dying off and they had to keep importing and replacing us, but you know, from 305,000 and we know that this is an estimate, so you know, I'm not arguing this is an exact number, but from approximately 300,000 uh individuals uh from various uh, states and regions of Africa, including West, Central, and East and Southeast Africa. My my DNA comes from Southeast Africa on my maternal side. So, um, so from that number, that three hundred thousand plus, in the modern times, and we go to our census now in twenty twenty, African Americans, our population is approximately 41.1 uh, million. So that's over a 400 year time span. And those are the and those are the people that only identify with just being African American. But those who want to uh, claim they mix heritage, the number in and jumps to 46.9 million people. So from 305 plus Af enslaved Africans over a 200 something year period that migrated here, not migrated, that were stolen and, and brought here through, through natural, you know, uh, means in terms of, uh, uh, you know, sex over, you know, an additional 200, you know, years and 400 years total. We've now, our population is 41, or you know, to an extent, forty six point nine million, according to the twenty twenty census data. You know, and I don't know if that includes all the ones who sweated they ain't black, but they're Moors, or that they are original Hebrews. We don't know if they take the census data, but you know, we're just going. These are just approximates, so you can see how. So imagine and notice how over time, even African Americans. The reason why we've been able to keep such strong African features for the most part is because of the rules and the ghettoization of African people when brought here to the United States. It wasn't like that in ancient Egypt. You know, they didn't they, they it wasn't an apartheid government that that forced, you know, the foreigners to exist only in one spot and they couldn't marry and have sex with 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 other individuals you know who belong to their ethnic to the ruling classes ethnic group it wasn't like that in egypt and and you know back in the day you know they they had no concept of race so they were you know if you saw a fine palestinian woman it's like hey sister come over here you know uh, let me buy you a drink at the bar and, and let's get it in they had no inhibitions there was no you know black white loyalty there was no, you know, in there was no concept of interracial dating. That's that's some new stuff. So, you know, imagine. So that's just 400 years here in the United States from from 500,000 uh, through, excuse me, 300,000 plus to 46, almost 50 million people. Right. And so. We, when we want to kind of estimate and see what is going on, even in ancient uh, uh, Kemet, 
you know, we we have processes in which we can kind of just get a, a sense and a feel. It won't be accurate because, you know, we don't have strong census data for, for over 5,000 years, you know, in Egypt. But let's just imagine for a bit. So, you know, you have to understand the concept of doubling time. And, you know, for all you finance majors and biologists, you know about doubling time and, you know, compound interest and all that other kind of stuff, you know, these, these statistical things. So there's a concept called the rule of 70. And, you know, so uh, I'll read here. It says to figure out how long it would take a population to double at a single rate of growth, we can use a simple formula known as the rule of 70. Basically, you can find the doubling time in years by dividing 70 by annual growth rate. Imagine that we have a population growing at a rate of 4% per year, which is a pretty high rate of growth. By the, by the rule of 70, we know that the doubling time, that means the time that it takes the current population to double in size is equal to 70 divided by the growth rate. That means our formula would look like this. So 70 divided by the growth rate, which is R, uh, in this case, it would be four. We only use the whole numbers. Um, <laughs> and so that would be 17.5. So that would mean every, uh, according to this formula, if there was a growth rate of 4%, uh, the rule of 70 tells us that 17.5, in 17.5 years, roughly 18 years, the population would double. And then in another uh, 17 or 18 years, that that population would double. And, you know, and I calculated this, you know, from the example I'm about to give at four at four percent. And it was just um, it was just ridiculous uh, how 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 that number is for the length of time that we're talking about. So, you know, I, I, I reduced the time I reduced the growth rate to get something that's a bit more manageable. Right. So I said that let's say that uh, there was only 20 individuals. So I've, I, I read all of that for a reason to show that since pre-dynastic times, there have been there have been people coming in from the Levant and the Sinai and Mesopotamia and, and the like uh, every year, you know, since to the present time, right? Um, but at least, you know, going throughout all Pharaonic Egypt. So let's just to make things even and clear, let's assume that only 20 individuals from the Levant migrated to Egypt every year from 3000 to 1 AD. That's a total of 3000 years. And, and the second thing is that they are immortal. So let's just imagine this group of 20 people per year, they didn't die and they didn't have children. They just they just live forever, right? At least to one AD. So, and in here I have LP, and that just means Levant people, right? So, twenty times three thousand—that's how many years is sixty thousand people. So, at the year one AD, in our hypothetical situation here, there would be sixty thousand people from the Levant living in Egypt you know, um, dispersed how we want to. And let's just say that the is evenly split 30,000 and 30,000 men and women, right? And they're immortals. So now during the year 1 AD, they, they, they're starting to lose their immortality and they need to uh, have children and reproduce. So let's say that they have a growth rate of exactly 1%. So the rule of 70 states that you know, you divide 70 by the uh, growth rate. So that means 70. So that means every 70 years, the population would double, right? So now, so, so that's 60,000. So in, in another, so in 1 AD, so when we go to 70 AD, it's going to be 120,000 people at a 1% growth rate, right? According to the rule. So now let's now calculate the doubling rate from one to uh, year 1001 AD. So that's 1000 years. We're only going to do 1000 years. So um, so 1000 divided by 70 equals 14.29 cycles of doubling. 
So there's going to be 14 times within that thousand year time period that the population is going to double from the year one, uh, one AD to uh, 1001 uh, AD. So in 1000 years, the population of the Levant people in Egypt would be 1,257,549 and um, I'm sorry, no, I'm reading that wrong. So it is 1,257,549,549 uh, and keep in mind that uh, this is only, and you know, this is just to show you that if, if everything was, you know, even, of course, this is an approximation is only here to give you kind of an example. So currently right now in Egypt is 102,000, uh, excuse me, 102 point, uh, or 102.3 million people living in Egypt today. And so this doesn't include people dying, you know, um, invasions and the like you know we got to understand but i just want to show you like how it's possible to have a large number of of people with foreign ancestry living in your territory and how it can grow in numbers so that's how for example the 300 thousand africans over that time period became um 46.9 million uh, today in only 400 years. So imagine that, you know, just, and that's just coming with 20 people trickling in every year. And we know it's an exaggeration. And um, so, but it's just to give us a rough estimate here. And so I want to give a living example. So remember that from the text on, on the Egypt, on, on the foreigners in ancient Egypt, they talked about the Syrian rep, um, weavers, right? Now, this is a picture of some Syrian refugees. This is a photo that I took when I was in Egypt in 2015. So if you check the news in 2015, there was a lot going on in Syria. And, you know, it caused a lot of people to scatter in various places in the world. And of course, one of the closest places is Egypt. And so this photo was taken in the Nubian village. And so you can see the color of the Syrian, right, in their hairstyle. And, you know, they got modern clothing. It's not really distinct about that, you know. Uh, but they're in, we're in Aswan in a Nubian village. And so what I'm going to do is just show you a video of when we were on the boat, you know, passing by. So. I ain't going to be watching the people. So you see some Nubian. It, it, I don't know if you can really see, but these are just Nubian black folks because we're in the Nubian village. So I'm passing just by regular Nubian black folks. Keep going. Some more Nubian brothers. But hold up. These are Syrian children. In the in the in the water with their dad. We're on the Nile River. So they're waving at us. They, they chilling, living. They ch oh, let me go back. Oop. I'm sorry, I should have. So here we go. Let me go back just a little bit more. So you see, it's just a pocket. You know, another Syrian lady, you know, probably dealing with her daughter. So we're in we're in the Nubian village in Aswan, along the Nile.
I guess that's it for that. Uh, let me just double check. Yeah, I'm just taking photos of water now. So, so um, at this time, they're saying that who are the, uh, this is an article um, from this time period. This is from 2016. Uh, and it's talking about, you know, 5 million refugees and immigrants in Egypt currently, right? And so in the article, it talks about the Egyptian government's claim of 500,000 Syrians in Egypt is currently not reflected in a spike in the number of registered refugees, nor does it immediately accord with the difficulty Syrian refugees have in entertaining Egypt. So th they're saying here that the Egyptian government is saying they have 500,000 Syrians, but the, the authors is saying that, you know, that may be an exaggeration, but let's just assume that they are right. You know, especially so after the ouster of President Morsi, when the political climate turned sharply against Syrians who were accused of supporting the Muslim Brotherhood. In 2015, registered Syrian refugees decreased from 138,000 to 117,000. Tadamon, the Egyptian Refugee Multicultural Center, estimated in 2015 that 10,000 Syrian refugees went to Turkey and hundreds were resettled in the West, and many chose to take the perilous Mediterranean route to get to Europe. But keep in mind, I'm trying to let you know the numbers here. So imagine, so if if, if we have 500,000 Syrians in this day and age, so in, in let's just assume this is 2022, and then in 2,000 years, how would the population look with that many immigrants and everybody intermingling with each other over that stretch of time? It's not the, the phenotypes, and especially if it was a dark place, I mean, uh, um, in... in like a sea of dark black folks. And so they're in the Nubian village. So at this rate, especially since they have reduced the number of, 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 of Nubians in the country and either pushed them out because of the Aswan Dam, you know, or other things, you know, and forced them to leave, which, which has been done. You know, a lot of these, the quote unquote black Africans have left Egypt. And, and migrating into other areas, and others have stayed. But imagine 500,000, let's assume, you know, we know that they're probably scattered all throughout Egypt, but let's assume that even that 138 or 117,000 of them live in, the, in, in Aswan and is living among the, the Nubians there. How would the Nubian village look in 2,000 years? How would the Nubian village look in 3,000 years? See, it's, it's, we, we got to be serious when we're, when we're having these conversations. And so, you know, when you see, for example, the, um, like I have this slide here, this is the, this is the last section and we'll be wrapping up here, um, on the importance of the Jewish phenotype. So remember those, those, um, uh, those clips that I showed or those those images that I showed of the people out of the Levant and out of Asia and their their phenotypes as described by the ancient Egyptians visually in the artwork. Right. So we have this text and shout out to Brother um, Garfield uh, for sending me the um, this 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 information upon request. Um, and so I went and got the translation. Uh, this is from a, a Mishnah, you know, a Tractech Nagayim. And this is, this is uh, kind of the work of a Rabbi Ishmael. And he lived during like the, the first century and, and between the first and second century AD. So during the Roman, you know, occupation and dispersal of Israel and all that in you know 70 AD. So he's 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 part of the the Jewish community. He describes the Jewish community. And so he says in this text uh, in in the Talmudic text the children of Israel may I atone for them are are like escroa boxwood uh, which is a type of wood or tree 
not blacks and not whites, but rather in betweens. So he's describing, so for all of those Hebrew Israelites that claim that they black, and at this time during the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and a little bit around there, you know, the, the rabbi is describing the, the Israelites and, and the, the, the children of Israel as an in between, not blacks and not whites, right? We, we read in this text here, it's called uh, God Laughed, uh, Sources of Jewish Humor um, by, you know, Hershey H. Friedman and Linda Weiser Friedman. Uh, and, you know, you're right, the, 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 the Talmud was racist as hell. And so in this text here, the, the author states, on the other hand, it is interesting to note that some recent genetic studies shows that Jews as a group do share a common ancestry, that is, that the so-called Cohen gene or the priest gene is more prevalent in Jews than in the general population. Of course, over the centuries, Jews have intermarried and otherwise intermingled in whatever nation they happen to live in and among uh, producing white Jews, Asian Jews, black Jews, etc. Hence, today, there is no single skin color or racial template for the Jewish people. Even in Talmudic times, the sages, and that's for everybody, you know, arguing against uh, Whoopi Goldberg, but that's another conversation. But... Um, so he says, even in Talmudic times, the sages contemplated this question. And we is this is what we just read. Rabbi Yishmael states, the Jewish people are like the Eshkroa. They are neither black nor white skin, but of an intermediate color. Eshkroa is usually translated as a wood from a boxwood tree. Apparently, the natural Jewish skin color was originally closer to the color of boxwood, a kind of yellow brown then Caucasian white, and thus probably closer to the skin color of many Sephardic Jews that, than that of most Ashkenazi Jews. So they're darker than Ashkenazis, which is just straight up Russian white folks, and um, but, but, but nowhere near the quote unquote black spectrum, right? It's this yellowish kind of color. And so, uh, what does it say? On the other hand, similar to membership in a race, you can't easily get out of being Jewish. According to traditional Jewish law, anyone born of a Jewish mother, whether observant or not, is a Jew. And a good luck trying to get out of that. All right. So that's on page 299 of that text. So that's it full in Hebrew. And so let me see. Uh, what am I? So we wanted to know about this Nagayim, right? And so uh, this is the, the full Hebrew text. And so so we're, we're talking about Rabbi, right? The, the, the Rabbi Yishmael. So this is the full text and context in which the what we cited was being stated. So this is an original Hebrew, and this is the full thing. So it says the they're talking about a kind of a sickness and how to determine whether the sickness is you know do we we govern it by the same rules for other folks who have different skin complexions uh, or do we judge it by our skin complexion so he's responding he says the bright spot in a german appears as dull white and the dull white spot in an ethiopian appears as a bright white rabbi ishmael says the children of israel may i be an atonement for them are like boxwood neither black nor white, but of an intermediate shade. Rabbi Akiva says painters have materials with which they portray figures in black and in white and in the intermediate shade. Let therefore a paint of an intermediate shade be brought and applied around the outside of the nega, uh, not nigger, but the nega, and it will then appear as on the skin of an intermediate shade. Rabbi Judah says in determining the colors of negaim, um, the law is to be lenient and not stringent. Let therefore the Nagayim of the German be inspected on the color of his own body so that the law is lenient and let that of the Ethiopian be inspected as if it were on the intermediate shade so that the law is also lenient. The sages say both are to be treated as if the 
the disease or the uh, whatnot was on the intermediate shade. So treat treat the uh, the disease on the extreme white German and the Ethiopian black according to their skin color. That's what he's saying here. And so the the Nagayim that we're talking about is these blemishes. It's the third tractate of the third order to Harut in the Mishnah. It consists of 14 chapters. Nagayim describes the various forms of Tzavath, a leprosy-like disease described in the Perishiot of Tazia and Metzora, uh, the Torah, which affected the people's clothing and homes. Da, 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 da. So we know this is a skin disease. So when you're looking for certain types of blemishes in the, in the color. So, right. So Rabbi Ishmael, um, he was the head of an academy and our Akiva's intellectual rival at the time of a harsh Roman persecution. His teachings had an important impact on Jewish law and thought. Perhaps most famous among his teachings are his 13 exegetical principles. So this is just a, this ain't an actual photo. This is, of course, somebody's imagination, but he lived um, between you know, 110 and 135 CE, right? And so, you know, here it is, Eshkra, again, neither black nor white, but of an intermediate color. Um, this is uh, a text talking about what the box tree is, right? So this is, this is wood from the box tree. You see the color? I don't know how it's going to translate you know, depending on what kind of device and your color settings, but you see this this variation. They're saying that this is the color of the Jews at this time. It, it's, it's this range, it's intermediate, right? So this is the same color variation that you see in terms of the the classical literature about their the 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 other groups, the Syrian. They're all the same populations. Uh, and, 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 you know, historically in terms of their, their, their biological and cultural relations. So when you're talking about the Canaanites, whether you're talking about um, the, the Israelites, the Arabs, they all have this boxwood, you know, type of color, you know, in, you know, in, in, in today's, uh, I see Jet and B says, you know, tan. So that's, that's the color. So notice the contrast between that and the Egyptians which is this dark, rich, brownish red um, to black, which we'll see in other forms here. So that's this is what we see. So the Egyptians, when in the ancient times, they never depicted themselves in groups like this. And then this is the colors that you see, you know, in regards to the um, the the immigrants from 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 Lebanon to you know, Iraq and all of those other folks who came and trickled down into to Egypt. So, you know, when you have a, a large population like this, you know, to come in, it changes the dynamic uh, if there was any kind of inter uh, intermixing with the groups and or population replacements as people moved and migrated. And so this is the color, like this is a perfect example of that type of color. So this is on the darker side of that boxwood type color that you see here, right? And so this is this is the kind of color that you see during the Roman time of the Fayum mummies and their portraits. And so when you see these uh, portraits of, of these Egyptians, this is not representative of the original Egyptians who existed on the land prior, who everybody else was describing as black. They were never described by foreigners, the Egyptians, using a uh, language like intermediate and tan and boxwood. They were all consistent, and no matter what language they spoke, they always used the word for black in their language. And so this, this here is the result of intermixings and sexual selection, you know, evolutionary sexual selection in large pockets, uh, starting with the high concentrations in the Delta and then moving southernwards. 
This is what all the literature states from the Egyptians themselves and the archaeological record and from eyewitness accounts. So this is why they don't want to have this discussion. So these, you know, just more examples of some, you know, extreme dark, you know, uh, Nubian folks. And then in comparison with the Syrians and Libyans of that boxwood, you know, color. So here's that boxwood color again of that, those groups. So all you black Hebrew Israelites, this, this, these are the, the colors of the folks at that time. It's not your black ass. You know, another Amu Asiatic. So when 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 they start throwing, you know, these these from the Roman period, it's just as we state. So we're not arguing that you're not ancient, you're not the descendants of ancient Egyptians. We talk, we we are arguing that, but we're also arguing that you are the descendants of various different uh uh other groups as a result of admixture over a time of 5,000 years. And so the whole the whole skin color debate and stuff is just out of context. This is why it is virtually useless to talk about genetic studies and who were the ancient Egyptians. It's a silly concept. You don't have enough DNA studies in all time periods, in all areas, to have any uh, statistically significant correlation to, to make an argument based on genetics. Because we know for regardless of what you think, regardless of what their genetic profile may have meant at the time, they depicted themselves in a particular way that was different from the people in the in the Levant. Always consistent in every single time period. And I was going to go somewhere, you know, with this, but I, I'm already, I'm already going on four hours. So I know it was already going to be long, but I'll save this for another time. Um, so I hope y'all, for those who stayed the long haul, uh, enjoyed the presentation. Again, I'm going to break these up into, you know, hour intervals. And, and upload them separately so those of you who have not um, or, or who will be catching the archive, you know, they'll be in digestible, you know, phases uh, for you. So I do appreciate uh, each and every one of you for joining the conversation. I did see uh, a donation earlier. Um, it's probably too far up for me to uh, recognize it, but I do want to acknowledge you in some way. I forgot who it was, but I want to say thank you uh, for your um, contributions um, who uh, who have, you know, provided, you know, um, uh, support for this channel and, and even the upcoming film. And that extends to uh, those of you who, of course, went to the China Into website as well as donated via uh, cash app i uh, see um i see your contributions and want to acknowledge you uh as well so and you know so i hope i know this was a lot to digest you know and then I, I wasn't able to keep up with everything in the in the comment section but you know i will take a few questions these last 10 minutes and uh, you know, let me know, you know, what y'all think, you know, of the conversation. You know, <laughs> he says, this, dope, this should end the gossip, but it won't. It won't. You know, they, a, a lot of people have been presented this information before, but they have selective amnesia. They act like it don't exist. And so, you know, this, this is why we have to have a serious conversation. Uh, appreciate it, uh, Medjai, uh, Al Baobal. Um, and so, you know, the whole point of this was to for me to give you resources. 
to give you source material for those of you who um, who do not have uh, or who are not familiar with the the arguments and the conversations and the like. And uh, Carol Asperum says, Jews are not a race. No, not confuse Hebrews with Jews. The Hebrews are black. Jews are a mixture of black and white. No, sorry. Um, you know, we're using them interchangeably here. Uh, but the Israelites themselves, they were not they were not what you would call stereotypical black folks. And again, with a lot of the the, the black Hebrew Israelites, and remember, I used to be a Hebrew Israelite. A lot of a lot of what y'all fail to to understand is that the ancient Egyptians throughout their entire 3000 year history have been recording who the Semitic speakers were since the earliest times. And they don't look like you. And, and that's and that's 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 what's problematic. And so y'all want to ignore the evidence and the the, the primary archaeological record um to to keep this fantasy that we were hebrew israelites no um let me see how come the libyans become lighter with time too same reason were they also invaded by asiatics yep and there was a, a dark population so we we saw one of the um the the citations which which when he came to to visit in the 1800s the berbers were black according to him and this is what he saw with his own eyes. So we got to look into, you know, these and, and, and be critical. So we got to understand, you know, to, to be able to discern, you know, the valuable information from stuff that is just trash. And you're going to get that in a lot of the old records. So it just takes some training into to the, the, the study of the literature or whatnot. And so I appreciate it. Uh, Negus and he said that looks like FBI most wanted. And I and I know what slide you're talking about, but even you you referencing it. Um well, let me scroll that back down. Um uh, says Brother Sorry, this was fire. Uh could we get a series on the specific places, select culture aspects? uh specifically come from where kings and queens specifically come from yeah you know maybe in the future um I'll, I'll have to see i have to plan something like that out and it would have to be this you know probably like at the end of the summer um and i have taken this semester off uh because of the the trip to egypt and how long that would take and i don't i don't want to be taking classes and having to do homework and be on a trip so i've taken you know a couple of months off and then you know uh, i'm packing up and i'm moving back to philly in in march when we return and so i got to prepare for that move and then i start classes again in um in april and so uh, so it's just a lot going on. So I'm gonna be kind of MIA for for a minute, and and then of course I'm gonna be conducting some interviews and putting a you know working on the trailer. So something like that. That detail was gonna take me uh, some time to concentrate. Uh, that that will have to be probably at the beginning of the fall. Um, so I hope that answers uh, your question. He said, "Can you show the image I Facebooked you?" Uh, I'm not even on Facebook, so I don't I don't know what you're talking about. Let me go to Facebook 42 tribes and see if did you tag me in something? Um, I don't see. Uh, let me see. What is this? Let's So I guess he's talking about sharing this. Uh, what was it? Two seven. So I guess is this. It says they were dark skinned, but they were not black. 
They were not Negro. The lips and the nose were not Negro style. It was different. Sahih was Minister of Antiquities, Egyptologists. Exactly. They didn't have the same nose. So we see this flat, wide nose, big lips, and the like in the artwork. It's just, Zahi Hawass is just a joke in, on, on all, in all ways imaginable. Um, so, you know, I already know that a lot of these folks are going to be in their feelings. And I'm going to get a whole bunch of ratchet comments. But, you know, what they won't do is get their best scholars together. And for us to have a, a an academic conversation about the peopling of ancient Egypt, its history, and the like. Uh, uh, Kali says, is anything being done to address the conference being canceled? Uh, yes. And so we're just waiting because it's it's fresh. So it was it was only canceled officially like a couple of days ago. So a lot of things is being moved around. Um, as we speak and it's being re it's been rescheduled and as soon as we get more information i'll of course share that with the public um uh, he says uh, yeah people act like there was some invisible barrier that blocked black africans from thousands of years from migrating and living in north africa exactly you know and what and what's what's sad about that is that you can admit that black african people are the ones who left africa migrated and populated the entire planet on every continent with except antarctica or the south pole i guess and but for some reason during the the quote-unquote historical period black people just was unable to walk like it was just their bodies just shut down when it came to to Egypt and North Africa. Populated the rest of the world just walking. But for some reason, you know, when it comes, oh gosh, there goes Egypt. We need to turn back now and, you know, not occupy that territory. Oh Lord, there's North Africa. There's allegedly some light-skinned peoples in North Africa. We can't be around them. Oh Lord, there's there's desert and you know we this inhospitable desert we can't walk there but as soon as soon as uh arabs and and berbers and stuff come into history then they could just walk all up in the desert and 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 all these kind of interactions around the world. it's just silliness you know and it's always the negro peons who are being you know the number one advocates of the the silliness uh he says, I know this question is unrelated, but when will you present the lections on Albion Seed? And there's so many lectures I want to um, do, you know, that, that I have just some just ready or some is just working on. But it's just life right now that is that has got me, you know, because as you all know, I'm, I'm back in the school. And so, you know, I got to prepare for, you know, to switch domains because this I'm dealing with technology and computer science. So that's a, that's a totally different domain. So I'm trying to before April make sure that I have this last book, you know, uh, on Kemet uh, ready and published, uh, so I could just focus on 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 science and technology and get out of there, and then go right back uh, and start working towards my um, uh, PhD and um, in Egyptology. So you know, we'll we'll see that in the near future. So let me see. How did how and did the ancient Egyptians always reconcile the foreigners after the intermediate period? Just mixed feelings. Um, kind of look into those books that uh, that I that I cited in the, in the text, and they they talk about that. Um, could this be said for all the Maghreb? Because I've heard arguments that Berbers have always looked Mediterranean because Morocco was connected to Spain at some point. No, it, it's we we have testimony of 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 ancient travelers and they're describing them as black. And then some is, you know, um, intermediate colors and light. It's, it's, it's not, it, you know, it just depends on time period and where, you know, because first of all, Berbers didn't originate um, in Morocco. You know, the, the, the argument is that Berber languages originated in Sudan. 
And so from Sudan, it traveled north in into quote unquote North Africa. And so, you know, unless you're trying to say that light skin, just this one little pocket of light skinned people originated in Sudan, and then everybody else was just pitch black, you know, surrounded them. You know, we can't have that kind of silliness uh, in our discourse. We always got to be serious and got to be rigorous in our analysis. Uh, let me see. You think the conference will have a big political effect in Egypt? I don't know. You know, it's hard to kind of test the temperature because we're, you know, online. So we'll see when we get there. Uh, he said, presentation made things even clearer. The indigenous culture was black, African, and later with admixtures. Yeah, because it's all about the culture. See, once we, once we, once we settle the genetic issue, and we, we, and we figure out it's not about the genetics, and it, and it's just about the culture. Now we start getting into some situations to where they can't back out of, because, you know, as I, for example. Uh, I'm going to share my screen uh, again, right? And I'm going to go to the last slide, or kind of the second to the last slide. So uh, from current slide. So <laughs> as I stated in a previous conversation, the ancient Egyptians... When when they identified themselves, they identified themselves as the Remetch. Hold on, let me get this uh, off the screen. Um, so that y'all can better see. Let me just put that here. Um, maybe my... Uh, thing is and I get rid of that so hopefully all right so it should be all right so what you see here uh the ancient Egyptians they called themselves the the Remetch right that was the that was the true ethnic name of the ancient Egyptians is always Remetch in the Coptic times you know, it was pronounced Romy or Lomi. And it just simply means man, husband, or human being. In the plural, it means human beings, you know, persons, whatever, right? So they just called themselves the people, the, the, the person or whatnot. And so when you when you look for that word in the Berber languages or amongst the Semitic languages, it doesn't exist. This is how you know, uh, I should say, that that is supporting evidence for it not, the, the, the initial original Egyptians not coming from the, the Berber speakers or from the Semitic people. Because the very fundamental word for human being, for person, for male, for husband, does not exist in those languages. But when you start examining these other African languages, we find all these cognates in these particular areas. And these are just a few. I just didn't want to crowd the, the image. But of course, all in the Sudan amongst the Nuer, the Dinka, the Beha, the Afar, even in the Sumerian. And y'all should know my stance on the relationship between Sumerian and uh, Negro Egyptian languages, right? So going to East Africa with Oromo and the Somali in uh, in the, amongst the Bantu speakers in Central Africa and Cameroon, going all the way to uh, the, the Ivory Coast and, and Ghana and Mali, you know, you find these terms for human being, for person, all cognate with ancient Egyptian Ramech. And so we go by this, this principle called you know, the uh, the most diversity and least moves. So where you find a phenomena with the, the most diversity and with little movement in terms of its expansion, that is more than likely the center, the origin of that particular concept or language or even in bi biological terms, uh, you know, uh, a species or something like that, right? 
And so, you know, this is why these, these types of studies are important because we know just even by the name Ramesh itself, that it could have only come from a group that is related to folks in inner Africa and not outside of Africa. These aren't the terms for male and human being in uh, Indo-European. None of those surrounding other languages. You know, only these quote unquote Negro, Egyptian, China in two languages. And so, you know, it is, you know, it is what it is. And so let me get out of there. And let me say, he said that in Goonie Slider song. Damn, we need a lecture on that. Seems interesting. Yeah, man, I'm try I was trying to. I was trying to keep it under three hours, but you know, I didn't went. Um, that's what I'm going on four hours now, and you know, this is kind of long for me. I try to keep keep my shows digestible, so that's why I'm I'm going to break up the shows uh, and cut them into hour pieces and and re-upload them, you know, so so that people can can easily find you know phenomena, and then I'll try my best to kind of based on the slides break down break down the so you can cut right to them uh, to the to the sections and said if we follow their logic the ptolemaic period can make their claim to then what exactly and what he said that work people see me trying to listen <laughs> indeed 42 tries some aspect of berbers probably always look mediterranean uh, the peoples, but remember, white people are pretty new to the world, so their Mediterranean look has changed too. Yeah, I mean, what is a Mediterranean look really anyway? Um, so let me see. <laughs> he said, "Look a ship." Nope. And Tony's one of those uh, Arabized uh, Russian bot trolls uh, who don't understand history and just like to make comments, but but won't engage into a, with a serious uh, scholastic uh, conversation on the subject. And he says, they don't want that conversation at all. Exactly. He said, everyone should check Hawass response to the same question on BBC Africa series. Um, you should, you should uh, come back to the YouTube comment section. And if you find a video posted there, uh, so we can all watch it. That's right. So it could be the case some Berber ethnic groups were always black and some were always white and that they changed over time. That's a possibility. But again, you know, we don't we don't want to focus too much on genetics and phenotypes because we're we're reinforcing this concept that there's somehow a relationship between culture, intelligence, you know, artistic ability you know, cognitive ability and and phenotype and genetics. And that's all the conversation is is trying to so it's just the these these racial discussions are just uh modern, just new ways to try to re to keep old outdated tropes going and to make it seem scientific. It's all pseudoscience. You know, and so you, you have to have more sophisticated, more rigorous ways. That's why linguistics is very important. You know, archaeology is very important, you know, uh, to this particular conversation because people can adopt, you know, cultures, people can adopt languages and they can lose languages. You know, is is what is the inner logic and where in Africa do we find this most diversity and and least moves when it comes to these particular concepts and processes? And so that that come to over time, uh, come to define, you know, uh, the the African spirit, if we can say that, or the African spirits, if we, you know, don't want to singularize it. Um, so those pictures that you showed are people mixed with black and white people. Semi means half. Semitic means half black and white. Nope. Semitic is an actual word. Shem that means name. That's all Semitic or Shem means. It's a word that means name in Semitic languages in Hebrew. So then I don't know where you got that from. Uh, can you speak about George Reisner and his role in carving Egypt out of Africa? 
Thanks. That's that's a whole nother lecture. I'm not even gonna go there tonight. The strength of the Mbongi is excellent scholarship. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, he said Asar is Southern Africa. Those part of Africa is Southern Africa the the oldest part of Africa. Um, I'm assuming you're asking from the context of of human evolution, and I'm not sure. You know, this it's hard to say where humans originated, but where we originated, we know that, of course, it had to be heavily forested as we, you know, are one of the great apes. And, you know, so that was either in Central Africa or somewhere in East Africa. But some of the oldest evidence of, you know, just uh, human life, modern human life comes from South Africa. But that I wouldn't call that the oldest part of Africa, you know, because then you're now, I don't know if you mean in terms of humans or if you're talking about the continent itself. And, you know, the continent arises as, of course, as a result of uh, volcanic activity. And so we're talking millions of billions of years. And so that's that's a whole different conversation. So let me continue. All right. You assume that people existed for tens of thousands of years and ain't move, ain't given nowhere, had no science, religion. Exactly, man. They, like these conversations with these these trolls, they they force you know they they put you into these epistemological traps, and and you got to dumb down the conversation, you know, to to have with them, and and it's and it's a shame. So could you speak on Platonus and other well known Egyptians during the Ptolemaic period? Do you know of any primary sources that describe them? That's another conversation. I'm I'm, I'm avoid all conversations. That's going to force me to have, you know, pull out uh, slides at this point. He says, linguistic challenges make sense. Exactly. And the mummies of the 1890s were examined via DNA and proven to be like the present day population of Uganda, according to Dr. Charles Williams, Grand Scholar. Indeed. Um, he said, they cannot ignore the communication, they can't eat the language. Exactly. Medjai says it's, right. it's out of control and the Egyptian far right political parties have uh, politicized your conference to push their xenophobic agenda. Yeah, they're all racist. They're all Arab racist trolls. And, you know, there's, you know, we got to keep this in context as well. There's, there's, there's land issues that they have going on. So don't forget they're in a battle with Ethiopians. So they also, you know, it exaggerates their, their already racist attitudes and then they're muslims and so you know muslims already have a already racist attitude towards uh black people you know in, in that area and so you know a lot of black muslims like to deny that but that's that's uh simply not the case and and it comes out everywhere you go uh, they they see us as slaves they see us as unintelligent and and they think that you know by trolling that we we don't have the mental capacity to shut down, you know, all of that nonsense that they be talking when it comes to scholarship. And some of them recognize the the scholarship and, uh, you know, want to avoid it because now they have to contend with it publicly. So when they can, they, they try to use their political power so that they don't have this conversation. And we weren't even going to have this conversation in Egypt. You know, and so, you know, they were scared for nothing. The The whole point of the Egypt conference was to show the commonality between all African peoples. That's all we were talking about. The commonality between all African peoples. We weren't going to have no discussion about, you know, them weren't the original Egyptians and all this. It's just some BS that they made up uh, lying on themselves. So. Uh, let me see. Let me scroll. Let me just scroll all the way to the bottom because I'll be here. He said, uh, 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 "They're extremely violent." Man. Exactly. But um, I'm 13 minutes over what I said that I was going to do. So I do appreciate each and every one of y'all. I know that you know in less than 15 minutes. You know, y'all going to be gearing up to watch the Super Bowl. I'm going to be packing. So, you know, I, I if y'all have an after, if somebody has an after show or something on somebody's channel, you know, let me know or I'll see if I'm subscribed to you. 
and you know we can keep the conversation going i just got to end this video uh, so it's not 20 hours you know uh, pull a garfield uh or a a pseudo killers 12 24 hour show uh, so that i don't want to do but i do appreciate each and every one of you for watching those of you who have commented and you know if y'all have questions or whatnot um you know leave it in the comment section and don't forget that i gave y'all some video excuse me some articles uh to read on the relationship between genetic studies and history that will kind of you know further contextualize this conversation and thank you to brother conan lee for your uh generous donation uh appreciate it greatly so with that said what am i gonna do um we will see y'all next time probably in egypt i'll probably do a live show in egypt depending on the internet and and the wi-fi there but until next time hotel peace